Okay, good morning. Good to see uh, all of you uh, this morning. And so this morning what we want to do is uh, we want to talk a little bit about intra-household allocation uh, resources of households. And so this is, gonna, as we're going to see, is an area uh, that over the course of the last 15 or 20 years uh, has generated a, a lot of interest and there's a lot of important kinds of issues uh, kind of related uh, to this. Uh, as in the kind of the other talks uh, that have been given, let me just kind of encourage you as we go along, if you happen to have any kind of questions, just to kind of stop and, you know, we can talk about these things and, and revisit things. Uh, one of the things that we know is it doesn't really matter, you know, what country uh, we happen to be talking about. We know that investments on the part of parents and their kids are extremely important. This is going to be true in high-income countries. It's going to be true in low-income countries. It was true historically. It's true today as well. Uh, all of you, in some sense, are in part here. You've all worked very hard to get here, but you're also very much beneficiaries of these enormous investments that your parents have gone ahead and made, again, in you over the course of the last 15 or, or 20 years. Now, these kinds of investments that parents happen to take in their children, well, they, they're going to assume all kinds of forms, all kinds of forms that are going to be extremely important uh, to that child's welfare, again, either as a child or as they uh, become adults. Uh, these are going to be investments that parents are going to be making in their children's health from uh, the time that the child perhaps is in womb to later on. Those investments are going to be important. Investments that parents are going to be making in the child's education throughout their entire career. And so this may be formal edu education. It may also be informal in the amount of time that parents actually allocate to helping them, their children learn. But it's also going to be the case that one of the ways in which parents are going to be often influencing kind of the outcomes, the life outcomes of their children, are going to be these transfers that parents are going to be making much later on in life to their children, to what we often call inter vivos or lifetime transfers. And so after children go ahead and get to a certain point in their life, uh, parents again may also transfer resources to them. Here in China, it's not unusual for parents to help their children do what? buy houses that in certainly where I live in Toronto that's becoming increasingly common so that would just be an example of an inter vivos transfer later on in life parents are trying to help out uh, their children now these kinds of investments then that parents are going to be making in their in their kids again either when they're kids or when they're adults they're going to have all kinds of implications so first of all they're going to have important implications for the trajectories of these children's incomes over their lifetime and that we all would expect that uh, how well we're going to do in the labor market is going to depend on the accumulation of human capital, where human capital can be both uh, the investments that have been made in education, but also the investments that have been made uh, in our health. Uh, these kinds of investments are also going to have important implications for intergenerational class mobility, something that we had gone ahead and that we talked about uh, in an earlier uh, lecture. And these investments are also going to have important implications for inequality, the kind of inequality that we happen to observe, again, across households uh, at any given point in time, but also the way in which inequality may uh, evolve over time, you know, in part because of these issues related to intergenerational class or uh, income mobility. Uh, these kinds of investments that we see, that they often have a gender dimension to them that is extremely important, and that today that we're much more mindful of, much more aware of than what we were maybe than when I started kind of, uh, you know, looking at these things long time ago. Is anyone familiar with this term, Sen's term, missing girls? What's that making reference to? Pardon me? Okay, but more generally, what is that a reflection of? That's right, so that there's going to be gender selection. And so gender selection can take a variety of forms. We'll talk a little bit uh, later on about a paper that uh, how certain kinds of behavior may also influence uh, infant mortality. So SENS missing girls is just related to the fact that if we were to go ahead and to take a look at sex ratios, the number of boys to the number of girls, that, you know, biologically we expect there to be slightly more boys than girls, not a lot, but a little bit. But when we take a look at these sex ratios in a lot of developing countries, is that what we find is that these ratios are very high, often as high as 115, 120 boys for every 100 girls. And so this is one of these things that we see. We've certainly seen it here in China. We've seen it in other countries. We've seen it at other points in time. 
And so we see this reflected in part in terms of sends missing girls that may reflect differences in terms of investments uh, that parents may be making in their kids that may be influencing uh, such things as infant mortality. It may be making, reflecting decisions that parents may be making earlier on, again, at times of pregnancy. Uh, these differences are also going to be perhaps reflected in differences in educational attainment and literacy. So in lots of countries, either today or if we take a look at historically, there are often, again, sub substantial differences in terms of the levels of educational attainment uh, that we see that, uh, for boys compared to girls. We also see these differences often reflected in labor market outcomes, that we see differences in the kinds of jobs you know, that men happen to be taking relative to women, and even within certain kinds of jobs that we may see, and we talked about this or someone talked about it the other day, just differences in terms of the way in which women are being rewarded in the labor market relative to men. So that there are all kinds of ways, kind of manifestations, reflections of differences that are in part may be reflective of differences in the nature of the investments that parents happen to be making in their daughters relative to their sons that have extremely important consequences uh, for, certainly if you're a girl, but just have important consequences more generally. Now, if we thought about what it is that is going to be influencing these decisions that parents are going to be making in terms of these investments in their children, well, there's all kinds of motives, right? There's all kinds of things that may be influencing uh, their kind of behavior. You know, on the one hand, it could just be altruism. I care about somebody else. I care about my children. I care about my children's welfare. And that because I care about my children's welfare and I benefit as my children are better off, I, I feel good that that may also be influencing the nature of the choices that I'm making with respect to the investments at any given point in time. So here there may be a little bit of a kind of a, uh, a households are going to be facing certain kinds of trade-offs, but may find that investing in their kids uh, may provide them, again, more welfare than perhaps just either investing in themselves or spending the money on themselves. There's also going to be age, old, what we call old age security. That in lots of societies, one of the responsibilities of children is to take care of their parents when their parents get older. So this is certainly going to be a lot more common when we're talking about economies or countries where there's not a formal system of social security. And here it's going to be the obligation of the family the immediate family, the extended family to take care of individuals uh, as they happen to be older. And so in part, it may be that parents are making investments in their children today in anticipation that later on the children are going to do the exact same thing, that there's going to be a resource transfer from the parents to the children. And so by investing in the children today, it may put the, parent, the children in a better position to be able to go ahead and to provide or to transfer resources later on. Or it could just be a way to try to align incentives, kind of over the long run. I invest today in anticipation that in the future the child is going to go ahead and will be transferring uh, resources to me. And then also, it could also be reflected in terms of dynastic kinds of considerations as, as well, which also reflects some kind of dynamic decisions that are uh, being made you know, in the context then of uh, extended families. So, when we take a look then, kind of certainly with respect to uh, kind of gender, is that in lots of societies, what that suggests that if we happen to see differences in terms of parents' behavior or investments in, in girls versus boys, that what that suggests that, well, that there may be an important role of inherited social norms. So if we kind of ask ourselves, you know, why is it in certain societies, why is it in certain economies, why is it the case that maybe they're investing more in boys rather than uh, in girls, well, as I said, it could be a social norm. And here I'm just going to define a social norm in a very simple way. It's just it's going to be some kind of customary norm that's going to govern behavior in groups and societies. And so as a consequence of this social norm, that this social norm may put a lower social valuation on girls relative to boys. And so these biases that we see again in these societies where families are investing more in boys relative to girls, it just may reflect, again, this social norm where the social norm is, is that boys are valued more than what girls happen to be valued. Right? So just maybe no more than a social norm. And that these kinds of biases as a consequence of this social norm could be reflected in all kinds of ways. It could be reflected in terms of the nature of inheritance. So in some societies, it's only going to be the boys or the sons who are going to inherit wealth that's been accumulated by parents uh, over their lifetime. 
It may be reflected in terms of differences in access to land that these individuals are going to have uh, access to. It may also be re reflected in terms of differences in terms of their ability to be able to access credit in the financial market. So all of these biases, again, that may exist out there from social norms will, in fact, be reflected uh, in a variety uh, of ways and in a variety uh, of outcomes in this particular case. So as economists here, kind of the big issue is, is the big question here is what really are the mechanisms that are going to be underlying, in this case, these patterns and these biases that we happen to observe uh, with respect to uh, parental investment in their, uh, in their kids, and in particular, differences that we're going to be observing uh, in terms of investment in boys relative to, to girls. And so an important dimension, again, to these, to these uh, kinds of um, issues that we're looking at is really what goes on within the household. How is the household behaving? How is the household allocating in this particular way? How is it making resource alloc allocation decisions amongst its members? Because this decision, if we kind of thought about investments in boys relative to girls, this is really a decision, kind of an intra-household allocation decision, where the household has a finite amount of resources and has to decide how to allocate those resources to those kids, sons versus daughters. Right? So it's going to basically, in part, going to be reflecting then these kinds of intra-household allocation decisions uh, amongst its members. And this ends up having a relatively important implication for policymakers. And so why are we concerned about this? Well, we might be concerned about this in a normative way because we believe uh, you know, that gender bias uh, is in some sense something that we would like to minimize, that we would like to reduce. We'd like to see everybody in some sense treated fairly. But the implications for policymaking is that if we thought these, these kinds of biases that we happen to observe in terms of treatment of boys versus girls was a product of norms, well, as a policymaker, that you might be relatively pessimistic. Now, as a policymaker, you know, why might you be relatively pessimistic if you thought that this behavior was a consequence of a social norm? Why might you be pessimistic about what you could do? What do we know about no most norms, most norms of behavior? That's exactly right, that these norms are persistent, often have very deep historical roots, and they can be extremely hard to change. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't change them, that they don't change, and that sometimes they may change very fast or very rapidly, but in general, that they do tend to to change relatively slowly. So if you thought that these biases were a product of norms and these norms themselves, again, are going to change only very slowly, you may not be very optimistic about your ability to be able to try to influence uh, behavior. But on the other hand, well, that maybe if you could get yourself inside kind of the black box of the household and maybe learn more about how households happen to be making these intra-household allocation decisions, that there still may be some way for policymakers to influence the decisions that households are making with respect to this allocation by possibly affecting the intra-household household allocation decision. So that even if, again, you can't do a thing with norms, so you, th these norms are going to be very persistent, they're going to be very hard to change, that there may still be other ways to try to influence these decisions that households are making uh, through other kinds of interventions that are ultimately going to be influencing the intra-household uh, resource allocation decision. And we'll talk again about a number of policy experiments that, get, that have been done over time that are trying to do exactly that. What they're trying to do is that through these policy interventions, they're trying to influence this intra-household allocation resource uh, allocation decision and, in order to try to encourage uh, and to facilitate an increase. Uh, in the resources that are going to be allocated to girls uh, relative to, to boys, okay? So what's our plan uh, for today? Well, the first thing that I want to do is just take a few minutes to just kind of provide a, a relative, very short review of a number of alternative models of the household. And these models, kind of the two canonical models, are going to be important because they have certain kinds of empirical uh, implications and important uh, empirical uh, implications. Uh, and they also, have, uh, they also offer very different kinds of views in terms of how these uh, households happen to be making uh, these decisions. Uh, the next thing that we'll do then is that after we've had this review of these alternative models of how households uh, are behaving, 
What I want to do is to take a look at a relatively small number, kind of a select number of empirical papers. I think uh, we have maybe four or five that we want to go and that we want to take a look at, that look at these decisions primarily in the context uh, of other developing countries where our primary focus is going to be in empirics. And that in selecting these papers, I've tried to select these papers. Some of them are old, some of them are a bit more recent. Because what they do is that they try to provide you a sense of the kinds of questions and issues that have come up uh, and how people have been trying to go ahead and to uh, address these issues uh, empirically. But you can also see in some sense the role that theory uh, is going to be playing uh, in each of these. And so these papers that we're going to go ahead and be taking a look at, they're just going to kind of help to highlight uh, the important role that the household of the family is going to be playing uh, in the context of decisions with respect to just you know, their investment in their children, uh, their gender kinds of differences, and also in terms of what we, what we refer to here is the way in which households may be making compensating investments again in their children for unequal investments that they may have made uh, in their children earlier on in life. And so kind of the thought experiment here is that I may have several children. Earlier in life, I may make differences in terms of their investments, in terms of the kids' education. We expect that as a consequence of the differences in those investments in education, the children's lifetime income trajectories are going to be different. So the question is then is that do parents then later on in life make compensating investments to try to offset some of those differences that would have otherwise kind of naturally emerged as a consequence of the differences that were made uh, at, uh, in earlier investments uh, in life. And so as we go through each of these papers, again, we'll try to be fairly kind of systematic about it. We're always going to be interested in, well, what's the motivating question? What is it that, that, the, that the authors are interested in? What's the kind of the question, the kind of the big question that they're going to be interested in? What is the role of theory in terms of the analysis and in terms of the paper? How theory is, is being used to help to either illuminate issues, to provide a set of testable implications? What's the empirical model and what's the identification? And as you're all probably already know, identification is just one of these things that's become increasingly important in all the empirical work uh, that we do. And as in fact, as was suggested, that any more that not only do you need to have a good identification strategy, but you also need to know an awful lot about what the mechanism is or what the channel is through the effect that you happen to be looking at uh, is in fact uh, going to be working. Talk a little bit about data, some of the key findings, and then some of these issues. And so for each of the papers that we go ahead and that we kind of go through, uh, this will be in some sense our strategy. This issue here is, is in some sense important uh, in terms of these motivating questions because that although uh, as you kind of take a look, kind of my own take, as I kind of take a look in terms of where kind of economic research more generally is that today all of us, or certainly you, are certainly much better trained technically in lots of ways than certainly what my generation was or Larry's or Chris's. So you're certainly much more technically trained than what we are. You're able to do things often at a level uh, that perhaps maybe 20 or 30 years ago we weren't able to. But what also often differentiates in some sense papers papers that I think that are insightful, that we learn from, that in the end are read, the technique is often is going to be extremely important because we put a relatively kind of high bar on that. But the motivating question is also going to be extremely important as well. And often papers are only as good as in some sense what the initial question happens to be uh, as well in, in that regard. All right? So you can do things, often have papers that are done technically very well, but the question may not be very interesting or may not be in the end the insight may not be all that great. So each of these papers, as you'll see, I think they ask a very good question that kind of motivates it. And from my own perspective, that's in some sense, if we even to, to ask in our own profession, what's the scarce commodity? The scarce commodity is in some sense the ability to go ahead and to be able to ask really good questions and then be able to go ahead and to uh, address them in a way kind of analytically and technically uh, that we are, are demanding. So we will go ahead, and so there's two kind of canonical models that we want to just kind of talk about and briefly go through so that we have a sense in terms of, of what their empirical uh, implications are going to be. Because as we'll see, some of the early work that was done in this regard is in fact concerned with either trying to test the extent to which this unitary model was providing kind of a reasonable framework for thinking about households or the extent to which a number of assumptions that are kind of implicit either in the unitary and the collective model in fact hold true. So it's important to kind of have a sense in terms of what these kind of uh, models are all about. So in the context of the unitary model, that what we want to do is that we want to consider a household. And in this household, there's just going to be two individuals. All right? So there's going to be a two-person household. 
And this household is going to have preferences over two goods, X and Y. Two individuals, so two-person household, husband and wife, uh, that are going to be consuming goods X and Y. And so the utility that the household goes ahead and enjoys is going to be a function both of how much of these two goods kind of in total uh, that they end up consuming, but also how much each of, uh, each of these goods, each of the individuals within the household goes ahead uh, and consumes as well. So this utility here is going to be capturing the at kind of at the aggregate level, it's going to be capturing the household preferences. And in the unitary model, the household is in fact going to be viewed as what we call a monolithic entity. There's just going to be a single set of preferences, a single set of preferences for this household, for this husband and wife, that are going to be defined, again, over these particular uh, goods. Uh, where are these preferences coming from? Well, they could be, there's just one set of preferences, but there could be two sources, again, of that single set of preferences. On the one hand, it could just reflect a consensus. Maybe between this husband and wife that they come to some kind of consensus in terms of what their preferences are over these goods, the value that they happen to be putting over X and Y and how much uh, each of these individuals, individuals happen to be consuming uh, of both of these goods. On the other hand, in the household, one of the individuals, typically the male or the husband, may just be a dictator. So in that case, insofar as that the husband is the dictator in the, house, in the household, it's going to be his preferences over the consumption that are going to go ahead and matter. So in the context of the unitary model, where are these preferences coming from? Well, they either reflect this consensus that we've talked about, where these two individuals, and I'll give you an example in terms of how that consensus might occur between individuals, just a consensus between those two individuals, or alternatively just may reflect the fact that in this household, one individual is the dictator, and so their preferences are, their, their preferences are going to be the only preferences that are going to matter. The household problem in this context then is very standard. What the household has to do is that the household has an endowment. What the household has to do then in light of prices that they happen to be facing out there, so PX and PY, the household has to make a set of decisions. How much of these two goods uh, to go ahead and to consume? And so out of this optimization problem, we're going to come a set of first order conditions that are going to allow us to be able to solve then for the total amount that the household is going to be consuming of these two goods, so X star, Y star are just going to be the utility maximizing choices for these households in terms of how much of these two goods to consume uh, in light of the prices that they happen to be facing out there and in light of what the household's total endowment uh, M here is going to be. But there's also, out of this optimization problem, there's in fact going to be some kind of implied division of X and Y between the two individuals within the household. So first of all, there's going to be a total amount of these two goods that the household is going to go ahead and consume. But there's also going to be an implied division. So how much of good X the husband consumes compared to the wife? How much of good Y the husband consumes relative to uh, the wife? And so they are going to be defined now in terms of these functions here, where these share functions are in fact also going to be functions of the prices that the household happens to be facing for both of those goods in the market, the household's endowment, but also the household's preferences as well. So these sharing rules, you know, how these goods are being allocated between these two individuals are going to go ahead and depend in this particular case, not only on the prices and the endowments, but they're also going to depend on these preferences that these households are going to have as well that are going to reflect the valuation kind of on the margin of these goods for the husband relative to the wife. Okay, so all of that is relatively fairly uh, standard. Now, this model then ends up having a number of important implications, and perhaps the most important is that in this unitary model, the way in which we view this household is as if what the household is doing is that, first of all, that they're pooling their resources. Right? So the household you know, happens to have an endowment. It could be an endowment of land, could be an endowment of human capital. So there's just some endowment that the household happens to have. And that the household here is just simply pooling these resources, and that in this household that the distribution of income or the distribution of those endowments or the distribution of those assets within the household or kind of who earns what is going to be irrelevant to the consumption decisions that the household happens to be making. So imagine that we thought that the household's only income in this particular case was wage income. The husband generates, earns some wages. The wife goes ahead and earns 
wage earnings and wealth. Suppose that that was the household's total income in this particular example. So in the unitary model, the way in which we kind of view the household's decision is that those earnings are pooled. Wage earnings of the husband, wage earnings of the wife are pooled. And that who earns what? So the distribution of that income, how much the husband makes relative to the wife, is just simply not important to the decisions, to the allocation decisions that the household uh, ends up ultimately making. And so this is sometimes referred to as, as the distributional neutrality. So all that matters in the unitary model with respect to the household decision about how to allocate these resources between the husband and the wife, the only thing that matters, in this sense, is total income. So it's the total income, the total earnings of those two individuals uh, that's going to go ahead and matter for, in determining both X and Y. And so as a result, that this unitary model ends up having relatively kind of stark predictions then uh, for household behavior. And that in particular, that what the unitary model would in fact predict is that changes in the composition of the income, the earnings of the husband relative to the earnings of the wife, aren't going to matter in terms of the decisions that the household happens to be making uh, with respect to consumption. All right? So it doesn't matter whether you know, the husband makes 100% of the income, or whether the husband makes 50% and the wife makes 50%, or whether the wife happens to be making 100%, who earns what isn't going to matter here in terms of the decisions that the household is going to be making with respect to how to allocate that income across its spending uses. And so that's what we mean by this notion of distributional neutrality. Right? Who makes what doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the total income of the household. Now, in this context of the unitary model, that you can continue to get unequal outcomes. So we were talking again just a little bit ago about this notion of unequal outcomes, so where we see all kinds of manifestations of the fact that girls, uh, in some sense, aren't treated as well as what boys are. Well, where could the unequal outcomes be coming, coming from? Well, on, the, on one hand, it just could be coming from those preferences that we talked about, that those preferences, again, may put a higher value uh, on the consumption of boys relative to girls. And so one of the reasons that we may see, again, differences could be there just could be differences in the preferences across these households in terms of how they happen to be valuing consumptions of boys relative to girls. It could also be the case that these unequal outcomes that we may be observing, they could be a product of differences in marginal returns. They could be differences of marginal productivities within the household. And so if you kind of thought about a household, suppose that you're a household and that what you wanted to do is you wanted to try to kind of maximize the amount of income that the household could earn. But suppose that the uh, individual's um, kind of earning power was in some sense tied to how much strength they happen to have. They were tied again to their brawn. So imagine a world in which we were all working in agriculture. Now, have any of you ever done any kind of agricultural work? Any of you from the countryside? Well, one of the things that you soon learn is that working in agriculture is one of those activities that can be very, very physically demanding. It often takes an awful lot of strength. It often takes an awful lot of energy. And often in those kind of physical tasks of agriculture, less so with modern agriculture, but certainly much so with traditional agriculture, uh, who do you believe in some sense has the more physical strength? So who would you anticipate has the more physical strength? All right, males do. All right, so what that might suggest is that in agriculture, certainly for certain kinds of tasks, that the productivity of men might be higher than what it might be for women. That because these are physical tasks that require a lot of strength and a lot, lot of energy, what incentive might the household have in that case? What would be the logical kind of implication or prediction? What would you have to do? Or what would you want to do? And so what are going to be the resources here? Food. Nutrition. That's right. So in fact, there's interesting papers that are out there that are trying to kind of make this kind of link, that there's often differences in terms of the physical productivity in certain societies, certain kinds of occupations between men and women. In those cases where uh, men, again, have more kind of physical strength, higher levels of productivity, 
and they're tasks and jobs that require an enormous amount of nutrition and energy to be able to do so, you can see again in those kinds of households that households are kind of skewing kind of the allocation of calories or food in those households to those individuals because on the margin those are going to be the individuals who are going to be able to make more. Right? So my point here is that there can be differences in these marginal returns to individuals in this particular case that in fact might lead a household to allocate more resources to more productive uh, individuals. But you can also see how certain, the way in which the labor market works can also be extremely important in this regard. Suppose that there's discrimination in the labor market. So when we talk about discrimination in the labor market, what do we mean? Can someone give me kind of a, a simple definition? Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah, let's, yeah. It can, yeah, it can be gender, but just, it can be gender, discrimination of any sort. But what, when we, as an economist, and when we use this term discrimination, what do we mean? Well, okay, that's one way we could, might look at it, but what other ways? So when people try to go out there and to try to find out if there's discrimination in the labor market. So we're going to look at returns to labor, but we have to be a bit more precise than that. What are we going to be comparing? That's right. So what we want to do is that what, you know, the kind of the thought experiment is that when we talk about discrimination is that we're trying to compare two individuals that in every, in every respect are alike, right? Uh, nevertheless, despite the fact that they are alike in every respect, that there's differences, again, in terms of the way in which they're be re being rewarded in the labor market. And much of the debate about you know, discrimination, the extent to which there's discrim discrimination against women or against certain groups in society often ends up depending upon these unobserved things that we you know, can't see. But my point here is that suppose that there was discrimination in the labor market and that women were less rewarded for certain kinds of skills and uh, and education, what are households going to do? Or what might households do in that kind of an environment? Well, that's right. So that, or just more generally, they're going to invest less. That if there's a perception that the returns to education, to investment in human capital is going to be less than in girls than what it is to boys, they're going to skew the investment in favor of boys rather than girls. So my point here in all of this is that even in the context of this unitary model, you can still get unequal outcomes. You can get these differences, again, between genders. Some of it just may reflect, again, these preferences uh, in the household. You know, on the other hand, there could be these differences in the productivity of individuals that could just be reflections of, as we've talked about, issues of kind of physical strength. It could also be a reflection of the labor market and maybe the labor market and the way that discrimination in the labor market may itself just reflect kind of social norms and, and preferences in society more generally. But in this case, that when people talk about discrimination within the household, discrimination may be optimal. The household is taking a set of prices out there, what's the return to investing in girls relative to boys, and then the household is making an optimal choice in terms of how it either happens to be allocating these calories uh, to the kids or how they happen to be investing in the kids' education in that sense, in light of these prices that these households happen to be facing out there, um, they're allocating their resources in a way that, from the perspective of the household, uh, is in fact uh, optimal. So that's the unitary model uh, of, the, of the household. The next model that I want to talk about is what is commonly referred to as is the, is the collective model. And the unique feature of the collective model is that it recognizes that within the household, kind of these individualistic elements within the household. And that in the household, rather than there being kind of some kind of aggregate set of preferences that are going to be uh, kind of capturing what the household preferences are, that in these households, that a household is in fact going to be made up of a group of individuals who are going to bargain with each other with respect to over-resources in the household. So, and that's, I think, in some sense, maybe kind of conforms to a lot of our intuition in terms of the way in which households happen to be working. I guess you're not married yet, so once you kind of get married, you can soon kind of realize that there's always bargaining in some sen of, of some sort uh, that happens to be going on. But what's critical here in the collective model is that we want to look at or kind of think of the household as being made up of a group of individuals, that these individuals' preferences, again, may differ, again, in a variety of ways, and that these, house these individuals within the household are going to be bargaining, again, with each other 
uh, in a number of ways over uh, how resources within the household are going to be uh, allocated. Now, one of the kind of critical assumptions of, this, uh, of the collective model um, and with respect to the uh, uh, intra-household allocation of resources is that th this allocation is, in fact, Pareto efficient. So that how the household ends up allocating its resources within the household uh, is going to be Pareto efficient. Now on the production side is that what that in fact means then is that within the household, insofar as this household is going to be allocating resources, again across activities, that what the household is going to be doing is it's going to be doing it in such a way that it's going to e equate the returns on the margins to all of those activities within the household. So if you kind of thought about a household is going to be involved in a wide variety of activities, this is perhaps maybe a bit easier to see kind of in an agricultural setting where households are having to make decisions about how to allocate resources to uh, a wide variety of activities. On the production side, again, the implication is, is that this household is Pareto efficient, that it's going to be allocating resources across a wide variety of activities, and it's going to allocate those resources in such a way that it's going to equalize uh, the returns, again, on uh, the margin. So what that effectively means then is that the household is going to have a certain amount of resources. They're going to allocate these resources efficiently. So it's as if what the household is trying to do with its resources is to kind of maximize the size uh, of the pie. Subject to that, then each member uh, in this particular case then is going to be maximizing their own utility uh, subject to their expenditure uh, on goods uh, and services. So here, so unlike the unitary model where there's just a single set of preferences that are going to be capturing again, the household's utility, here there's going to be individual utility functions that are going to be reflecting these possibly different preferences of individuals that make up this household. So here's going to be the uh, utility function. It's just going to capture the preferences uh, of the, let's just say, of the husband. Uh, here would be, again, the preferences uh, of the wife that would be defined, again, over her consumption. We could certainly make this more complicated if we wanted to, where we could allow the households, uh, the, the, uh, the utility of the husband, so his utility not to depend not only on his consumption, but it might also depend, again, on his wife's, you know, as you might expect, and, and the same thing here, but just to kind of make life simple, we're just going to go in that we're going to assume that for each of these individuals in their household, uh, that their utility only depends on their own consumption, right? So in this particular case, then, well, what's the objective of the household? Well, we happen to have these two individuals. Their preferences, again, may very well differ, again, in this regard. Well, the objective function, then, for the household is to go ahead and to maximize some weighted average of the utility of the husband and the wife. And this is just no more than a weighted average. It's just going to be a weighted average of the utility of the husband plus uh, the utility of the, of the wife in this particular case, where mu here, this weight here, the weight that we're assigning, how important the consumption is of the husband relative to the wife in the household, uh, is going to go ahead and depend on the bargaining power of these two individuals within the household. Right? So when we said kind of at the outset, household's a group of individuals who happen to bargain with each other over resources, that's what mu here is trying to go ahead and to capture. Right? So it just kind of reflects the bargaining power of these individuals within the household and so when we ask ourselves, and well, where are these weights, in some sense, uh, coming from? Well, they're going to be coming from, you know, prices are going to matter. The total endowment of the household is going to go ahead and matter uh, as well. But they're also going to go ahead and depend on, so the bargaining weights, how much weight the husband happens to have relative to the wife in the household, uh, that they're also going to go ahead and depend on the distribution of the income or the assets within the household. They're going to go ahead and depend, again, how that in the endowments within the household are going to be allocated between the husband and the wife. And so that you might imagine that households are going to differ very much, again, in that regard in terms of these endowments, uh, in terms of these resources, uh, in terms of income that are going to be influencing the bargaining weight that these two individuals happen to have in the household. So kind of a thought experiment just to kind of you know, see how this might matter. A matter, imagine a household where um, maybe the woman comes from a very wealthy family uh, and she you know, happens to have a lot of income that she's gone ahead and inherited in this particular household. Imagine the husband comes from a family of much more modest means. The only kind of income that he comes to the table with are his earnings. Well, in that kind of household, if we thought about 
the distribution of income or assets within the household, well, they'd be very different than a household in which neither family came from family of means. The only income that two families had were just the earnings that they went ahead and had. So those two families may differ very much in terms of the bargaining power that women had, again, in the household relative to their husbands. So the important thing here is that households are going to be maximizing some kind of weighted average of the utility uh, of the uh, two individuals, that the preferences that these individuals have over the consumption of these two goods, no reason for it to be the same, and in fact that we might expect it to, uh, to differ. And the weight, uh, on the other hand, is going to be tied in terms of how the distribution of endowments within the household are going to be allocated between the husband and wife. And in general, that what our intuition is, is that women are going to have more weight, again, kind of in this bargaining problem in the household, the more of the control that they happen to have over the assets or the larger portion uh, that they are contributing to the household total, uh, total income. Now, even in the context of this collective model, that there's still going to be a number of conditions under which this collective model just basically collapses to the unitary model. So what are going to be those cases? Well, first of all, it could be a case in which the preferences of these two individuals are identical. Right? So this problem here is just going to collapse to the unitary problem if it turns out that the utility functions of the husband and the wife are identical. And so that's going to start maybe get us to kind of ask some questions. Are there reasons as to why we might expect, you know, preferences of husbands and wives to be identical? Uh, it could also be, even in the context of this collective model, that we could still go ahead, it would collapse to the unitary model if mu was equal to 1, if the husband had all of the weight in the bargaining power. So if the husband had all of the weight in the bargaining power, then just kind of by definition we're back to that dictator model that we talked about before where it's only the preferences of the husband that are going to matter in terms of how the household is going to be making these decisions uh, over the allocation. Now, what about empirical issues relating to kind of testing uh, these two kinds of models? Well, the early papers that were done, and so here we go back probably almost 15 and 20 years ago uh, to some of the work uh, of Duncan Thomas, uh, who's now uh, at Duke. What these, kind of early what these early kind of tests did is that they tried to go ahead and tried to take a look at the influence of assets, the distribution of assets within these households, to see again how they mattered or how they were influencing the spending decisions that households were going ahead and making. And in particular, one of the important kind of empirical implications of that unitary model was that the income or the assets of the individuals within the household shouldn't matter. The only thing that matters is the total amount of income that the household uh, happens to be earning. So there were an awful lot of papers that were done that were trying to identify or that were using household level data that had information on earnings of women or earnings of the husband, earnings of the wife, or maybe assets that were controlled by the husband, assets that were controlled by the wife. And they went ahead and they tried to use that information, particularly with respect to income uh, of the husband versus the wife, to see how it was influencing the decisions that these two individuals were, uh, the, how the household was making with respect to certain dis, dis, uh, spending decisions. Now, as you might imagine uh, in this particular case, that the, the empirical issue that soon kind of arose is uh, certainly of omitted variable bias. Uh, and that, uh, it, that in particular, the assets or the incomes that may be under either the husband or, or the wife's uh, control may also be correlated with all kinds of unobserved variables that are influencing the spending decisions of the households. So here they're just running very simple regressions, looking at certain kinds of spending patterns. They're regressing these on income earned by the husband relative to the income uh, of the wife and trying to see if who earned what mattered for the spending decisions that were being made by the uh, household. Well, again, the concern is, is just kind of this, uh, this omitted variable bias. These things that we don't observe that would be affecting those spending decisions uh, that would, in fact, be correlated uh, with the assets that the uh, husband or the wife either uh, earned or were under their control. Uh, another issue that also goes ahead and rises is just the way in which the marriage market works. The way in which the marriage market works, or kind of a stylized view of the marriage market, uh, is that individuals tend to marry individuals or try to marry individuals often who are very much like themselves. In other words, that what we see is positive assortative matching, where people with very similar kinds of attributes uh, marry uh, each other. Well, imagine that we went ahead and that we lived in a world uh, in which a husband uh, 
is a dictator. And now imagine what the world would look like or what things would look like if we lived in a world of a unitary model where the husband was a dictator, but there was positive assortative matching that was going on in the labor market. Well, if you happen in this particular uh, context that if you happen to be a woman who is going into the marriage market with more assets, or maybe a woman who is going into the marriage market with higher levels of education, what influence is that going to have? How are those women kind of in general, all else equal, how would they fare in the marriage market? So kind of all else equal, we have women in the marriage market, some who may come from a uh, family with means, so they have more assets. Women who have higher education. What do you believe is going to be true about those women in the marriage market? Kind of all else equal. Oh, that's right. That what you would expect, these women are going to be more valuable in the marriage market. They're going to have more kind of bargaining power in the, ma in the marriage market. And you would expect these individuals to be in a better position, as you so nicely said, to be able to select individuals who are a lot more like themselves in that regard. So it kind of enables them, it makes them more valuable in the marriage market. So they're going to be able to be able to have a lot more power, or at least uh, in this particular, to find or to select husbands who happen to have preferences uh, that are going to be nearer to theirs. So in this particular case, then, is that suppose that we were to go ahead and to run a regression of women's assets on certain kinds of spending decisions uh, of the household. And suppose that that happened to be correlated in that regard. Well, the question that we start asking ourselves, then, well, is that a consequence of the fact that these women in these households actually have more bargaining power? Kind of in the context of the collective model, the collective model would say, oh, OK, these women happen to have a lot more power because they have more assets, they have more earning power. And so in the household bargaining power, the choices that the household is going to be making are going to reflect a lot more of their preferences relative to their husbands. Alternatively, it could just be we could be living in a world where the household is a dictator, but here that because these women who happen to come from certain kinds of family, higher education, maybe their preferences are different. Maybe they, their preferences, they put a higher value on certain kinds of spending decisions, maybe spending decisions with respect to their kids. And maybe because they're more valuable in the marriage market that they're able to select husbands whose preferences are very similar to theirs. So we could still be living in a world of a, of a unitary model with a dictator where it's the husband's preferences matter. But because of the sorting that happens to be going on in the marriage market, we're generating this correlation between the assets of the woman and the spending decisions that the household happens to be making. So here you can see in this particular context just kind of some of the empirical difficulty of being able to try to go ahead and to actually kind of test uh, these kinds of models. Do we live in the unitary or do we live in the collective uh, kind of world? What's a better description of the way in which households happen to be, be behaving? So there's a, you know, in the 90s and the 2000s, just long list, again, of papers that were trying to do exactly that, but would run into all different kinds of problems, either because of the sorting going on in the marriage market or just for other reasons. Uh, what would be kind of the ideal experiment that we would like to be able to identify uh, these kinds of effects? Well, certainly one of the ideal experiments would be some kind of form of a random transfer. Suppose that there were random transfers that were made to households that could either be made to the male or to the female that exogenously, in this particular case, influenced the allocation, influenced the endowments or the income uh, of these two individuals, husband versus wife. And then you could go ahead and you could compare how the differences in terms of who, the, who received the transfer, how that affected the spending decisions of the household. And so the Progressa program, which is uh, one of the first of kind of the experimental programs that was begun in Mexico back in the uh, early 2000s uh, under T. Paul Schultz. Uh, this is one of the first, again, of the experiments that began to try to get at this, again, in a particular kind of way. And there's just been kind of a long kind of list and history of papers uh, that have kind of grown out of that. Uh, and the other was a one that uh, tried to kind of leverage, not a, in some sense, a kind of a, a, an experiment or these random transfers, but rather a classic paper by Lundberg, Pollock, and Wells back in 1997 uh, that tried to go ahead and take advantage of a policy reform. Uh, and in this case, then, the policy reform that they were uh, trying to uh, 
uh, leverage in this particular case were changes that were made in the British Child Subsidy Program. So for a long time, Britain had a subsidy program towards children. For a long time, the way in which that subsidy program was in fact directed, uh, it was a, in the form of a reduction of the tax liability of the husband in the household. What they did with this reform is that they went ahead and that rather than giving the subsidy in the form of reducing the taxes that the husband had to pay, and in Britain, much like Canada, unlike the United States, husbands and wives have to file their taxes separately. In the United States, husbands and wife file joint income, so it's differences in terms of husbands and wife in terms of tax treatment. That kind of tax subsidy that husbands used to receive was in fact uh, changed into a subsidy that was in fact given to the wife or the woman in the household as well. So here what that change in the program effectively did was to change the gender who was receiving the child subsidy and then they used that as a way to take a look in terms of how that affected the uh, spending decisions that were being made uh, by households and in particular with respect to their expenditures on women's uh, and men's clothes or women's and children's clothes versus men's clothes. Now, why might clothing be a good example here? Let's just suppose that we thought about children's clothing. So the nature of the experiment here is that, or kind of the policy experiment, kind of this natural experiment is going on, is that we're altering the income of fathers versus mothers. The subsidy used to be extended to the father in form of you know, his uh, uh, taxable income. Now there's a subsidy that's being given directly towards the woman. What about preferences? So kind of implicit here, can anyone kind of maybe see what in the back of their mind about the differences in preferences between fathers and mothers? What might be the differences in preferences? Pardon me? So here we're talking about expenditure on clothing. Okay. And so who would you, so let's just suppose that we thought about expenditure on children's clothing. Who might you imagine might put a higher weight? That's right. So that maybe we thought that there were differences in terms of the preferences of fathers versus mothers. Maybe mothers put a higher weight kind of on the welfare of the children, in this case is reflected in terms of the expenditures uh, that the families were making uh, on, their, uh, on their children's clothing. And so in this particular case, if, that if you go ahead through this kind of policy, kind of natural experiment, what are you doing? You're altering kind of the allocation of the income in the household. You're reducing the husband's income. You're increasing the wife's. If we thought that there were differences in preferences between those two households, differences in the value that they put on the margin of spending on children's clothes and other things related to children versus husband, then in that particular case you'd expect that policy, as a consequence of that policy experiment, you'd expect to see an increase, all else equal, in terms of the expenditure on children's clothes. And so a lot of this kind of work here was, has also been done in terms of trying to identify often adult goods versus children goods, male goods versus children goods, and there are a lot of papers kind of in this literature that in terms of male consumption goods, uh, anybody have any thoughts on what might be two prominent male consumption goods in almost in lots of societies? Cigarettes, Cigarettes that's one. The other? Alcohol. Alcohol. That's exactly right. And so that what they would do is they try to take a look in terms of how household spending decisions on those two goods differ depending upon kind of the allocation of, uh, of resources within uh, the household. So here then we have a little bit of kind of a summary in terms of these kind of two kind of classic models, the unitary versus collective. Uh, they both take kind of slightly different perspectives in terms of how households happen to be uh, making decisions, um, both of which, again, are in principle uh, important, but uh, in some sense are, are going to be largely uh, empirical matters. So let me just see how we're doing on time. So what I want to do now is uh, I want to go ahead and I want to go through a number of papers. Uh, a number of papers I think that in some sense are kind of reflective of this literature over the course of the last, you know, maybe 15 or 20 years that are trying to kind of get at these issues or kind of key issues in a variety of ways. And each of the papers, uh, maybe with the exception of one, uh, is in some sense kind of a, a classic paper. So the first paper that I want to talk about is a paper that was done by uh, Esther DeFlo in 2003. 
Uh, the title of the paper is something like Grandmothers and Granddaughters, so kind of a, a classic uh, paper by, by, um, uh, by Esther. What's the context and setting? So here in this particular case, that, you know, what she's going to be interested in is kind of these decisions that households happen to be making with respect to allocation uh, with, uh, of resources within the household, and in particular, uh, the allocation of resources uh, within the household. And what she's going to do is that she's going to try to kind of leverage a policy experiment, or maybe a policy reform. And the particular policy reform that she's going to leverage here uh, is this pension reform that was undertaken in South Africa in 1993. Uh, this, in some sense, was an extremely important pension reform. It was extending the pension system to black. So before, there was a pension system, but there was a pension system uh, that was only enjoyed by, uh, by whites uh, in the South African context. And so it was going to be a pension reform that went ahead and tied uh, benefits to both incomes and age. So there's going to be some conditionality. So that when we talk about kind of conditionality uh, of a program, we mean there's going to be certain kinds of conditions that you need to satisfy in order to be able to be a beneficiary uh, of this particular pension reform. And so here, this particular reform was going to be tying the benefits to the incomes of the individuals uh, as well as what their, uh, their age was. What's moreover, what's also uh, important about this particular reform is that the transfers that these households were going to be uh, enjoying as a consequence uh, of the uh, pension reform is that these were going to be permanent changes. This just wasn't kind of a one-time kind of thing. This was going to be a permanent change that these households were going, or individuals were going to be able to enjoy as a consequence of this policy. So it was going to be a permanent change in the household's non-labor income uh, after the household formation. Uh, what was going to be the objective? Well, the objective was then that in the context of this particular setting of pension reform that was going to go ahead and provide certain individuals within these households uh, these pension benefits, is that what she wanted to do then is to take a look at the impact that this pension reform and the fact that now certain individuals were going to be receiving this pension income, the effect that it happened to have um, on child welfare. And in part, again, child welfare, and in particular, on spending decisions that were being made by the household that would, we would expect uh, to be reflected uh, in child welfare. There's a variety of ways that we can measure child welfare. Uh, two, perhaps, of the most important are child nutri nutritional status. So one of the ways in which we measure child nutritional status mm -hmm. is height for age, is that we go ahead and that we take a look. And at any given age, we would expect children to be of certain heights. One of the problems that we see in a lot of developing countries is that we see a problem of stunting. Has anybody ever heard this term, stunting? Anyone know what it means? Well, maybe without even knowing what stunting, what that term again may mean, in some low-income countries, maybe compared to higher-income countries, what might you expect to be the relationship of height for age? Or let me, let me get you to do something even simpler. And I, I've certainly noticed this over the course of the 30 or 35 years that I've been doing work in China. I see how tall you are. I compare it to how tall your parents' generation is. I compare it to how tall your grandparents' generation is. Have you noticed the same thing? <laughs> What's happening over time? That's exactly right, that you are getting taller. So each, in some sense, uh, um, uh, subsequent generation is getting taller. Now, that's not magic. Right? It just doesn't kind of magically happen. But rather, it's going to be a reflection of nutrition, nutrition and diet. So that's going to become extremely important. And we expect nutrition and diet to be tied to uh, a country's uh, level of development or to a household's level of income. So that what we see in lots of developing countries, because households are constrained in a variety of ways, they don't have all the resources that they need in order to be able to provide uh, the nutrition that their children need, is that we're going to see kids that are often much shorter at any given age than what we would expect. So that there's certain kinds of tables that are kind of out there. So uh, you know, given your kind of particular, it may differ again a bit by kind of ethnicity, but there's going to be these tables that for any given age are going to be able to predict, again, how high you should be. But what you may find at certain ages, you may find some kids that are going to be 
a lot shorter all else equal than what they should have been. Now, clearly in height, there's going to be a genetic uh, dimension to it, kind of independent of the nutritional component to it. But here we're talking about uh, the nutritional component. So height for age is going to be a very important kind of indication of access to resources uh, and nutritional status, as will uh, weight for height. So one objective then is just to take a look at the impact that this policy is going to have on these uh, outcomes for children. The second question that the paper also wants to try to tackle is the extent to which this household happens to be operating as a unitary entity. And so remember that when we talked about kind of the key hypothesis of this unitary uh, entity, that what it meant that in the context of these households that who made what didn't make any difference in the context of how the household happened to be allocating decisions. So it didn't matter in terms of the allocative decisions that were um, uh, made by the household in terms of who actually enjoyed the income. So in the context of this particular program here, where certain individuals are going to be, tie, are going to be, innate, are going to be allowed now, are going to be receiving these benefits if they happen to be of a certain age, what you want to kind of imagine now is that we're going to have these households that here, maybe familiar in the Chinese context, these are going to be extended families. Anyone know what we mean when we talk about extended families? That's right. So it's going to be a family where it's just not going to be you and your folks, but your grandparents uh, are going to be living with you as well. Now, I'm just out of curiosity. Of those here, how many of you, at any point in your life, did your grandparents live with you? Okay, so there's okay, certainly some cases here where your grandparents live with you. Well, your grandparents, you're going to have grandparents on your maternal side, so your mother's mother and father. You're going to have grandparents on the paternal side, all right, uh, and then you have grandmothers and, and grandfathers. Well, here, that if we happen to believe that the household operated as a unitary entity, and in this household there was someone who was living who was, in fact, a beneficiary of this pension program, then if we thought that the household was a unitary entity in that particular case, then the identity of that individual, that older person, that grandparent, maternal side, paternal side, grandmother, grandfather, isn't going to make any difference at all in terms of the decisions that are made. Shouldn't make any decision whether it's sons or grandsons or granddaughters that are in fact going to be made. So, She's going to go ahead and be able to take a look and to see the extent to which uh, the household operates as a unitary entity because there's going to be differences, again, in these households in terms of who's, in fact, going to be the beneficiaries. Uh, and then kind of this question here that's very much related to the one I just kind of posed here is to look at the extent to which the efficiency of this public transfer program, and here, how we, what do we mean by efficiency? Well, efficiency is going to be certainly in terms of helping you know, these individuals who were, uh, in some sense, it was directed towards, but also in terms of possibly benefiting other individuals in that household as well, is to go ahead and to see the extent to which this public transfer program depended on the gender of the recipient. So here we have these individuals who are going to be beneficiaries of this program. It could be males, older men, could be older women. The question is, does it make any difference? Is the effect, again, of these pension programs of giving the, the, uh, the benefits to the husband, I mean to the older man, older women, does it have differences in terms of kind of its spillover effects within these uh, households uh, that they uh, happen to go ahead and to be living? Now, there's all kinds of kind of identification issues that she has to be able to deal with in this particular context. And one of the nice things, again, about this paper is that she addresses each and every one of them, I think, in a, in a very kind of nice and kind of systematic way and identifies kind of what the problem is. First of all, that if we wanted to go ahead, and we'll go through this a little bit more carefully again just in a minute, that if we wanted to go ahead and if we wanted to take a look and to find out if children who are living in these households uh, with pension recipients, the impact that it happened to have on their nutritional status, well, suppose that we just, the experiment was, or suppose that what we did is we just compared any of these kind of measures. And so sometimes we refer to these as Anthrop uh, prometric, anthropometric measures, just a big long word for these kinds of things. Suppose that we were to go ahead and we were to compare uh, children along either of these dimensions, children who happen to be in households, who happen to be where someone is living that's a beneficiary of the program, 
compared to a child who happens to be living in a, pro, living in a household where there's nobody who happens to be a beneficiary of that particular program as well. Well, one of the concerns, again, that we would have that when we're comparing those two children is that these two kids are, in fact, are going to be living in very different households. That it's much more likely that a child who happens to be living in a household where their grandmother or grandparent are living with them and they're also receiving these benefits that are tied to incomes, this is probably going to be a household that is going to be, in some sense, disadvantaged relative to those other households other children are living in where grandma and grandpa don't live with them in this particular context. So one of the concerns is going to be that there's just going to be omitted variable bias. Omitted variable bias between these two kinds of households. Right? So other things, again, that we can't observe about the household uh, that is going to be influencing the outcome that we're interested in, these kinds of measures, again, of child welfare, that are also going to be correlated with the fact that there is someone an elderly person, grandma or grandpa, in that household that are going to be living with them that are, in fact, going to be beneficiaries of this pension program that was, in fact, tied to income. So first, you're going to have this problem of admitted variable bias. The other issue that's going to go ahead and to arise is that when we're looking at some of these measures, and this is certainly going to, this is true for height for age and much less so for weight for height, is that child height is a stock. It's a stock that's going to be reflecting investments that will have been made in these children uh, over their entire lifetime. So it reflects accumulated decisions and investments. So if we were to go, just go ahead and suppose that the pension program was started last year and we wanted to go ahead and we wanted to take a look at the impact of this particular program on, in this case, height for age, that's just simply going to not be a long enough period for us to be able to go ahead and to identify any effect in this particular case that the program may have had. And so this is also going to go ahead and impose certain kinds of requirements in terms of where the identification happens to be coming from. And so here, that, to kind of get around this issue and the fact that child height, height is a stock and it's reflecting these investments that are made over the, the child's kind of entire lifetime and certainly early, uh, child, uh, early childhood, is that she's going to go ahead and try to take advantage of differences within households. And so these are going to be households where there are going to be multiple kids, some kids who would have been uh, too old to perhaps to have been beneficiaries of the kind of effects that these programs had. So here she's going to be taking advantage of, of the identification is going to be coming from within households in order to be able to uh, identify these effects. The other problem that's going to arise, and this is a problem I think that frequently arises but probably doesn't get a much, as much attention as it probably should, and that is the fact that household formation is endogenous. So here we happen to have these households these kind of often kind of multi-generational households, these decisions of, the, of these individuals to go ahead and to, uh, to live together, in fact, this is going to be reflecting all kinds of things, but it's an endogenous decision that these households are going to be making. Typically, one of the things that we, and that clear that there are returns, again, to these individuals or to these multiple generations to be living with each other. One of the things that you observe is that as societies tend to get richer, what becomes a lot more common? What kind of household becomes a lot more common? So it's the opposite of a nuclear household. I mean, I just said, the opposite of an extended household is what we refer to as a, as a nuclear household. It's just going to be the husband and the wife and the kids. So if you take a look, certainly in the West, in terms of the percentage of households that are nuclear households, that's increased very much over time. Even if you take a look at China, and you take a look at data, this could either be for the countryside or for the cities, that what you see that over time, the percentage of nuclear households has actually gone ahead and increased you know, over time. So although there's, you know, uh, it's these nuclear households have generally increased over time, what's going to be important is that this household formation, the decision of these households of children to live with their parents, parents to live with their parents, this is a decision that's going to be endogenous, and it's going to be important in this regard because there may be certain kinds of things about the household's preferences that are influencing either the desirability or their decision for them to live all together that may also be influencing their spending decisions as well. So it's going to pose some, some issues here in terms of the uh, identification uh, that we need to be worry, worried about and that she's going to be worried about uh, in this particular context. Okay? So those are the kinds of things that this is in some sense what the objective uh, of the paper is. You can kind of see how it happens to be situated in the context of this literature a big issue in the development context about child nutritional status.
and that you can also see then the kinds of identification issues that just naturally arise uh, from trying to uh, assess the impact that this policy uh, may have had. Okay. So the first, so we'll take a look at this kind of in steps then. And so there's, I think, maybe kind of uh, two or three kind of basic sets of regressions uh, that she's going to be looking at uh, to try to go ahead and to try to get at uh, these issues that we're concerned about. And so the first set of regressions are going to be just simply weight for height regressions. So what we're going to be doing is that within these households, we're going to have measures for all the children that happen to be uh, in these households. We're going to know, have a measure of just the ratio of their weight for height. How much you weigh, how tall you are, just going to take the ratio of that uh, particular measure and that in general, at least up to a point, higher, larger number is better, although it's certainly the case that one of the things that's happened uh, in lots of settings is that child obes obesity has become a problem. So at some point, uh, that height for, uh, or that weight for age may in fact, if it gets too big of a number, uh, may not be a, a, a good thing. So here what we have is that we're going to have this measure uh, of this uh, kind of health of the child, uh, weight for height. So it's just going to be uh, individual I who happens to be in household J and who happens to be in cohort K. And so that cohort is just going to be picking up you know, when the child uh, was, um, uh, was born. And then she's going to start by just including now just a simple indicator, a simple indicator uh, in these regressions for whether or, not the whether or not there was an individual in that household who was in fact eligible to receive the, uh, the pension benefits. So it's going to be an indicator, not whether they actually received the benefits, but in fact, whether there was someone uh, who was eligible in the household to go ahead and receive it. Uh, this WIJK is just going to be a vector that's going to be capturing certain things about the household demographics. And in particular, the number of males and females that are going to be 50 and older. And 50 becomes kind of the critical age in which individuals uh, are going to be then, at least in principle, uh, eligible then uh, to, be, um, to receive benefits uh, for the program. This XIJK is just going to be a vector of other household background variables that are also going to try to control for other kinds of things that may be influencing the, uh, uh, the choices that households are making. And so what becomes particularly important here you know, is the fact that she's going to be including these variables that are going to be capturing the demographic composition of the household, and in particular, the number of individuals in the household that happen to be uh, 50 and older. So that becomes extremely important, certainly in terms of the comparisons and where the identification uh, is going to be uh, coming from. So the potential issues, I think both of these that we uh, went ahead and that we had talked about a moment ago, so one of the concerns is just trying to control for these unobserved differences between these households that are eligible and ineligible. Those households that are ineligible um, to receive those benefits, those are going to be households that in general are going to be of higher income, going to have more resources, and all else equal, we would expect kids in those households to be better off, and so that may invalidate the uh, comparison. Uh, and then the other concern that we also just mentioned a moment ago is just this issue about the endogeneity uh, of these households. These decisions, again, that these households are making about living together. And whether or not here the concern is going to be is that, well, is in fact this new policy that's going to be giving benefits to older people, is that in fact going to be influencing the decisions that these households are going to be making about whether or not these individuals live with them? And that, you, again, you might imagine that, uh, that that's going to be reflecting, you know, in a variety of ways, uh, you know, household, uh, may, may be reflecting, again, household preferences and other choices that the household uh, might be making. So these are going to be the issues that we're going to have to be concerned about in these regressions. So here, uh, what I want to do, I'm not going to go through all of the tables, but just a, kind of a few of the tables so that you can go ahead in terms of, of see what's going on. So first, we're just going to have a set of kind of ordinary least squares regressions where we're going to be looking, again, at the, uh, the effect. So here, it's just going to be, is the household eligible? In other words, is there going to be either uh, a male or a female in the household that happens to be eligible for the uh, pension program and be looking at the effect that this happens to have? And here, in this regression, she's going to be looking at the differences in the effect within the household of girls versus boys. Now, the title of this paper is Grandmothers and Granddaughters. Well, that's going to be a tip-off, and it's going to be a tip-off in two ways. 
First of all, it's going to be then that only that having elderly people that receive pension benefits in your house is only going to be, uh, you're only going to see some positive effects for certain kinds of pension beneficiaries. It's also going to be the case that only certain kids within the household are going to be beneficiaries as well. And it's also going to matter this maternal versus the paternal link is also going to be extremely important as well. So here in this very simple regression, is there an eligible individual in the household um, for the pension benefits? What effect does it happen to have uh, on these kinds of outcome measures for girls as well as for boys? Well, the first thing here that when she just runs this regression uh, where she doesn't, again, control for the fact that there may be other, there may be older members living in the household or she doesn't control for family background variable, the first thing that you see is you just don't find much of an effect at all of having an individual uh, who's eligible to receive the benefits again on the outcomes. But once she goes ahead and she controls now for certainly household demographics and the fact that there are older members that are living in this household, you can immediately see that it has a very pronounced effect on these outcomes. And in particular that what you see is it has an effect on the outcome for girls, but it doesn't have an effect on boys. So that having someone who is eligible for this program to receive benefits of this pension reform, it has an effect on these children's weight for heights measures, but the effect is only on girls. It has absolutely no effect uh, on boys uh, in this regard. Right? So those are going to be the uh, OLS uh, regressions. Then she's going to go ahead and she's going to go one step further. Rather than just simply looking at if someone in the household happens to be eligible, she can go ahead and that she can identify, well, is it a woman who happens to be eligible? In other words, is it a grandmother who happens to be eligible in the household? Alternatively, is it the, a male or a grandfather that happens to be living with the household that happens to be eligible as well? And if you take a look at these results right here, can anybody see what they're telling us? I know it's a little bit hard to see. So the effect of having a grandmother in the household who's eligible, the effect of having a grandfather in the household who happens to be eligible, well, I guess not very clear for you to see, but what's important here is that all of the effect is coming through grandmothers. So here the identity of the beneficiary in the household happens to be extremely important. So we see this effect on girls. We don't see an effect on boys, but moreover, that the effect is coming through the effect that in this household there happens to be a grandmother that is living with the household who happens to be eligible. That if you happen to have a grandfather living in the exact same household who happens to be eligible, then in that case, absolutely no effect at, at, at all. Right? So this becomes, again, in some sense, kind of the key kind of result. There's a separate set of regressions then where she wants to go one step further. There could be two kinds of grandmothers that could be in the household. There could be maternal grandmother, so in other words, the mother's mother. Alternatively, there could be the father's mother, so in that case, both grandmothers. She's going to go ahead and she's going to go one step further, and she's going to split this up in terms of maternal grandmother, paternal grandmother. And so through what channel do you believe you're going to find the influence? What, any guesses? That's exactly right. It's going to be through the maternal side. So that what matters is a grandmother, what matters is going to be a grandmother on the maternal side that has an influence on the granddaughters. So that's kind of in some sense the title, grandmothers and granddaughters. That's the key link that's going on here through which the channel through which uh, this program uh, is influencing, at least with respect to this measure uh, of uh, weight for uh, height. Let me see how we're doing on time. So just, I think all those observations, I think we've already gone ahead and, and made. Okay. Now the next one that we have to, she's going to take a look at are going to be these height for age regressions. And here these are going to be a little bit more complicated in terms, of, in some sense, the kind of identification strategy that she's going to have to use. Because a child's, again, height is certainly going to be influenced by genetic factors. It's going to, you know, we, um, you know, it's going to be tied in some sense to uh, what our parents height uh, is, 
but it's also going to be uh, influenced by these investments that are going to be made over the lifetime of the, chi of the child. Those are going to be uh, extre extremely important. And the two key factors here are going to be both nutrition as well as being free from infection. And here again, we primarily mean uh, access to, to medical care. So nutrition is going to be a reflection of the calories, how much calories we happen to have. And so there's going to be an association certainly between nutritional intake and how tall or, high, or, or how, how tall we're going to be and how tall we uh, uh, grow to be. But it's also going to be, uh, this kind of link here is also going to depend on being free from infection. So in lots of developing countries, kids, when they're small, uh, they experience all kinds of diseases, dysentery and other things. And one of the effect that those diseases, again, end up having or being exposed to those kinds of infections is that there's an awful lot of the nutrition nutritional intake that goes, in fact, in some sense to trying to kind of deal with the disease rather than being translated into calories that help to make you taller. So there's almost like a production function there in terms of how tall you are. So there's certainly a link between these calories and how tall you're going to be, but it gets also mediated uh, by how well you are. And so you're kind of access to medical care. So, but if you don't have access to medical care, you're suffering or experiencing things such as dysentery, then the way or the rate at which you know, the caloric intakes gets transformed into, into heights, uh, that function then is just going to uh, be, again, much, much lower. So the thought experiment here now is that what we want to kind of, what we're going to be doing here is that we want to consider a household that happens to have two children. And so in this household that there's going to be one of these children is going to be born at the time of the pension reform or after, and then the other child is going to be a child that would have been born well before. That's the way in which she's going to be able to kind of take a look at the effect that this pension reform has in, on this particular measure, given that the child's height at any given point in time is going to be reflecting these investments that will have been made over a long period of time. And so if you happen to be one of the, uh, an older child who was born well you know, before the reform uh, was carried out, well then if in fact there were any kind of resource flows in the household that were to be directed towards the children, you would be too old in some sense to be a beneficiary of those uh, kinds of resource transfers. And so in that sense, you know, your, how, your health, I mean, your height uh, wouldn't have been uh, affected. On the other hand, if you're a younger child just born at the time uh, of the reform and insofar as that these policies and transfers are influencing spending decisions within the household, you would have been in a position to be a beneficiary uh, of the additional resources that were being directed towards children. So here it's a very kind of simple diff and diff identification strategy uh, that she's going to go and that she's going to be undertaking. Uh, she's going to be looking at, so here this is just going to be that kind of first difference where she's going to be looking at the difference again within these households. So this is going to be an eligible household, going to be looking at differences within these eligible households between these kids again who would have been born after the reform, so kind of young versus old. So this is just going to be the comparison within those households that would have been eligible differences between young kids and older kids, kids who would have benefited again from the program versus those who wouldn't. And this is just going to be the difference again between households that would have been ineligible between same sets of kids as well. So differences again in households that would have been ineligible, higher income households, differences again between kids that were young, kids were old. And so here again, at least by taking this, this difference in difference, that what it's going to allow her to go ahead and to kind of do is to kind of control for any kind of differences that may have been occurring again over time that may have been contributing to increases in height just more generally, that may have been contributing just more generally in terms of weight for height. So what you might imagine if this was an economy that was growing over time independently of this policy that we might expect to see younger kids getting old or getting taller or um, relative, so uh, getting taller uh, for their age relative to their older siblings, independent. So here the diff and diff is just going to provide us a way to try to control then for those kind of time trends, again, that would have been uh, independently influencing uh, the height, again, of these, uh, of these kids. Right? So just a very kind of simple kind of diff and diff strategy that's uh, underlying the estimation. So the diff and diff is just going to help to kind of get rid of some of this unobserved family background variables that are going to be influencing the child investment. And so the way to do this is just a kind of a simple uh, interaction between the eligibility status uh, of that household with the uh, age of the child. And so what she's going to do is she's going to kind of re-estimate uh, this model. And so here's just going to be you know, some of the results. And I guess that these 
may be maybe just as difficult to read as what that last slide was, but in some sense the lessons are exactly the same. Is that what she sees here that when she's taking a look at this other kind of measure uh, of child welfare is that she's finding, first of all, the effect is coming through girls. That having someone who's a beneficiary of this pension program is having an effect on girls in the household. It's having absolutely no effect uh, on boys. Uh, moreover, that the effect is coming through the effect that it happens to have, again, through having a grandmother that's living in your household rather than a grandfather. So very similar to the other results, the channel, it's having an effect on girls. The channel uh, is through grandmothers rather than through grandfathers. And although it's not in this slide, but it's in one of the other tables that's in the paper, it's through the maternal side once again. So that same channel for both of these kinds of measures of child outcome uh, are going to be having an influence on the outcome for girls uh, rather than for boys uh, within the household. And so at one level, you can kind of see you know, why this paper has been kind of fairly influential. And the way to take a look always at how influential a paper is, just take a look at how many times the paper's been, been cited, you know, is in part, it, you can kind of see what that, the kind of the claim was of that unitary model was, how it might have been differentiated you know, from the uh, collective model. And this is you know, certainly by comparison to the papers that were done at the time, it's a relatively clean exercise to both to try to identify uh, the extent to which these kind of uh, changes, almost exogenous changes again, in these households, uh, access to income and who in these house, households had access may have, been, may have influenced uh, the nature of the spending patterns. Uh, the last issue that I just want to talk about just briefly and then we'll uh, go ahead and we can take a, a, a little break just has to do um, with this issue of, of household uh, uh, endogeneity. Um, and so the concern is, is that, well, maybe the, these results that we happen to be finding here may be contaminated by uh, household endogeneity and that this could you know, work again in a variety of ways. But in particular, it may be that families that, in which, uh, that allow or have their grandparents or having, well, in this case, uh, households in which husbands and wives have their parents living with them is that those households may be very different in a variety of ways in terms of their preferences than households in which uh, the grandparents don't live with them. So a simple story might be, suppose that individuals who happen to have their parents live with them, maybe those individuals are a lot more altruistic. They're a lot more altruistic. They care a lot more about their parents' welfare. And if they believe that their parents are going to be better off by living with them than by living by themselves, then they go ahead and they allow their parents to go ahead and to come to live with them. Now, can anyone maybe see why that might pose a problem here in terms of maybe just kind of this, some of this identification? So if households in which grandparents come to live reflect something about the preferences All right, or so it could reflect, so a number of, right, so it could, ref, it could reflect one of things. It could reflect, well, maybe the preferences of the husband and wife, they care a lot like their parents. Maybe there's some persistence. Maybe they're highly altruistic. Maybe their parents are also highly altruistic as well. And so maybe, again, it's going to be the case that in those households that different kinds of grandparents are living in those households, and so they're more altruistic. They care much more uh, about their children in that regard. But it could also just be a reflection, again, of you know, other kinds of preferences more joint. But you're right, that there's going to be some connection between the preferences of the parents, the preferences of the grandparents, and so that what we may be picking up is not anything to do about differences in terms of how resources are being kind of allocated within the household, uh, who, controls the house, who controls the assets or income, but it's just going to be a reflection of differences in, in preferences. And so there's going to be a number of things that she's going to go ahead and to try to do to try to deal with that issue, and in particular, that what she's going to do is that she's going to use as an instrument uh, variable that's going to be correlated uh, with the presence uh, of an eligible member, but is in fact not going to be affected by the living arrangement. And so here that when she goes ahead and that when she does that, so what she's going to do is that does the child have at least one grandparent in it who is alive and who is in fact eligible, at least by age, or likely to be eligible for the program. So she's going to use that again as an instrument, you know, more or less, so this is going to be used as an instrument for the receipt of the pension, and then she wants to see how these results are going to be, are going to compare when using eligibility, eligibility as an instrument, 
In general, the results are going to be fairly similar uh, with the effect through the grandmother on the maternal side, just as before, although it's going to be the case that the standard errors, again, are going to be a little bit larger and the level of significance uh, is a little bit smaller uh, as well. So, um, so here then, so you can kind of see how this paper was constructed, addressing an important set of issues. You can see, again, how she tried to kind of tie it to these alternative versions that we happen to have uh, in terms of um, uh, how households happen to be behaving. And it's a paper that also has had you know, policy implications as well. And that are there ways in which we can go ahead and organize often these kind of public transfers in a way that are going to have the desired outcomes uh, that we happen to be interested in. Well, when we come back then, uh, we'll take about a 15 minute break. The next paper that I want to talk about is also, again, I think a paper that today is widely cited that is also looking at kind of an alternative mechanism or channel uh, you know, through which you know, outcomes uh, for children uh, are going to be affected, and in particular, uh, infant mortality. So why don't we take, I guess, about a 15 minute break, and then we'll come back then at uh, 11.45 and, and pick up there, okay? As a paper by Jaya Trondin and Kuzemko, uh, it was in the QA, Q, uh, QJ 2012, and one of the, uh, I think, comments that was maybe made yesterday that, you know, in lots of these papers, one of the things that often makes a good paper is that maybe identifies a new channel, a new mechanism uh, that is affecting outcomes. And this is certainly going to be a paper uh, that falls into this category. You know, we've talked, uh, you know, already in terms of kind of motivating some of our discussion is that we've talked about, you know, just kind of this sun preference that we happen to observe in lots of societies, that the sun preference can be rationalized in a variety of ways, you know, as well, that, the you know, sons maybe typically have responsibility for parents as they, they grow uh, older. And so in turn, then, these son preferences or these preferences for sons over girls is gonna, can be linked to all kinds of to the differences that we happen to observe uh, in outcomes between boys and girls. But one of the things that's prominent then in lots of societies in which we happen to be observing these kind of preferences for sons is that one dimension in which we happen to see it is that it gets reflected in differences in infant mortality. And so infant mortality is just, you know, the probability that a, a child before some particular age goes ahead and dies. And that what we observe in lots of countries is that infant girls are much more likely to die than infant boys before the ages uh, of one or two. And so one of the, kind of the typical explanations that we have for why mortality or infant mortality for girls uh, is so much higher than what it happens to be for boys is that there's just lower expenditure on health for girls, for baby girls, for infant girls, and what there happens to be then for uh, infant boys. Now there's any one of kind of a number of channels through which these differences in kind of sex ratios uh, can, be, uh, uh, can be influenced again through fertility behavior. So one of the things that we see and that we see has become particularly again common is that if sons don't have a son, so currently if parents don't have a son or if they don't have the desired number of sons, is that one of the things that it may lead to is what I'm going to refer to here as both pre- and postnatal uh, abortion. Uh, that when we use this term kind of prenatal abortion, it basically means sex selection. You know, that today, because of the, the technology, that women are able to be able to identify what the sex of the uh, infant or baby is going to go ahead and to be. And if it turns out that the sex of that child isn't of the desired sex, that they may decide to uh, abort the pregnancy and to try again. You know, in other societies, what we refer to here often is referred to as postnatal abortion. Uh, sometimes it, the term that we use in English is infanticide. So infanticide is where deliberately, undeliberately, after a child is born, after the, ident the, the, uh, the gender of the child uh, is uh, identified, um, you know, the child may be, uh, may be killed or may be allowed to go ahead and to die. So these are mechanisms, certainly both historically uh, as well as today, through which parents are able to go ahead and to uh, kind of influence uh, the sex ratio. And both of these things contribute to the imbalances that we happen to, uh, to observe then in the sex ratio that we happen to, to observe. And so here what this paper is going to do is that at least in cultures in which there is not abortion. So societies kind of differ both in terms of the availability of using these technologies. They may also differ in terms of uh, their ability for legal reasons uh, to be able to use, again, these kinds of technologies. That in cultures in which abortion is not allowed, that what, what parents may do is that if they ha don't have either a son or they don't have the desired number of sons, is that what they're going to do is that they're going to 
try again as soon as possible. Now, what do I mean by try again? They're going to try to have a child. They're going to try to have a child as soon as possible. So here, no abortion. They're not. So the, here, they're not going to. There aren't going to be abortions. But if they don't have the desired number of sons, that what they're going to do is that as soon as they have one child and one child is born, they're going to go ahead. They're going to try again, or at least kind of as soon as possible. And so here, what this paper is going to do is to is to argue and to try to uh, try to identify a potentially important channel uh, through which this is going to be having an effect again on infant welfare, and in particular through the duration of breastfeeding. In other words, at how long a mother decides to go ahead and to breastfeed the child. And there's kind of two key dimensions to this that are going to be uh, important in this particular context. So first of all, it's going to be the case that uh, breastfeeding, so the fact that a mother goes ahead and breastfeeds her child, one thing that it's going to do is that it helps to kind of reduce postnatal fertility. In other words, that mothers who happen to be breastfeeding their children, it's much more difficult for a variety of biological reasons for them to go ahead to become pregnant again. So if, uh, in this particular case, that if a mother wants to become pregnant again and wants to increase the likelihood that she becomes pregnant again, given that breastfeeding kind of reduces the possibility of getting pregnant again, that what you're going to do is that you're going to stop breastfeeding. You're going to go ahead and reduce then, or just stop, either reduce, or you're going to reduce or stop again uh, breastfeeding for uh, the, your current infant children. So you're going to be much more likely to discontinue breastfeeding. The other reason why it may also have an effect is just the demands for pregnancy uh, are also going to go ahead and reduce the likelihood that you breastfeed as well. Just being pregnant is a physically demanding kind of activity. It just make it, may make it much more difficult, again, for the woman to be able to go ahead uh, and to continue to breastfeed uh, infant children that the woman uh, currently has as well. So breastfeeding is going to be extremely important here. So here you can kind of see the link between your desire to have more boys and breastfeeding in this regard. Because if you want to have more children, then that because breastfeeding makes you less fecund or makes it less likely that you're going to be able to uh, have children, that what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to discontinue uh, the breastfeeding. All right? Now, this is going to be important because we know that for a variety of reasons that breastfeeding is potentially going to be extremely good for uh, the child's uh, health. Uh, and so what she wants, what the authors want to do in this particular case is that they want to analyze the gender dimension of this decision to go ahead and to breastfeed. Are there differences between infant boys versus infant girls in terms of how long uh, they are breastfed? And the second thing that they want to do then is to see if they can make a link between then the breastfeeding and the health outcomes for the children. And so that insofar as that we believe that breastfeeding may contribute positively to the uh, health outcomes for the children, then differences in the number of months that children are breastfed you know, could have very important implications, again, for a child's health uh, as well as for infant uh, mortality. And that in particular, you know, that human milk, so that when children are breastfed, that it's going to have certain kinds of immunological advantages. It's going to help to make the children more resistant to certain kinds of diseases. So that could be a good thing that's going to be contributing to the health of the child and could be helping to reduce um, uh, infant mortality. But the other channel uh, that it's going to be uh, extremely important has to do with the extent to which these households happen to have access to water. So when households don't have access at least to clean water, so if you want to, if you don't breastfeed, what's the alternative? Well, you're going to use some kind of formula to feed the child. And one of the common forms of formula in developing countries you know, requires the woman or requires the household to mix some powder with water. Well, if you don't happen to have access to a clean source of water and you're mixing the powder with some water that might be contaminated in a variety of ways, well, you're going to be exposing, again, the child to all of the kinds of diseases that may be waterborne and carried by the water as well. And so what that implies then, at least for those households who don't have access to clean water, the fact that the mother decides not to continue breastfeeding and to use powder and formula as a way to go ahead and to feed their child, the child is going to be much more exposed, again, through uh, exposure to contaminated water to all kinds of illnesses and disease that may also then be increasing infant mortality. So here, the kind of this interesting mechanism or channel through which breastfeeding here and decisions again about breastfeeding 
may have longer run, may have implications for uh, infant mortality. And so that kind of the key contribution of this paper is going to be, first of all, it's going to identify a new channel, kind of a new channel that's going to be affecting uh, these differences that we observe in infant mortality between boys and girls, so differences, these gender differences, and that this is in some sense what might be called a passive channel, that unlike um, decisions with respect to abortion, where families go out, they may decide what the sex is, again, um, of, the, uh, of the child, and may decide that because it's not of the desired sex to go ahead and to abort the pregnancy, that's a very much kind of an active decision that the households are making in that regard. This is just really passive here. They're just making decisions about breastfeeding, uh, and they're making decisions, again, about breastfeeding because they're kind of tangled up with decisions about the number of children they want to have and the number of boys that they want to have in those households as well. And so the link here then is that through your decision about uh, wanting to have additional children, it's going to be affecting how long children are going to be breastfed and thus how long uh, they're going to be able to realize the, the benefits in this particular regard from being breastfed and thus not exposed, again, to some of the consequences that we've just gone ahead and identified here. And so kind of the key contribution here is that what they're going to argue is that there's a very high percentage of the differences that they observe or that we observe in infant mortality between boys and girls, right? So we observe a very high uh, difference between boys and girls with respect to infant mortality. Uh, girls are 40% more likely to die before the age, I guess, of, of two uh, in the context of India. And so what the paper is trying to do in this context is to try to identify uh, how important uh, this particular channel may be in terms of contributing to these differences. And that, I think, in general, that what they end up finding that maybe as much as a quarter of this difference that we happen to observe in infant mortality between boys and girls may be coming through the channel that we've gone ahead and that we've, uh, that we've identified. Now, there are several things that are very nice, again, about this paper. We simply, uh, we don't have time to go ahead and to go through it. Uh, but here, the, what, one of the nice things about this paper is that what they're going to do is that they're going to put down kind of a household model, kind of dynamic household model, and work through a number of propositions, work through a number of kind of empirical predictions, again, of the model. Uh, the models in the appendix of the paper, and here we're just simply going to kind of focus on what some of the key propositions are that are going to come out uh, of that model that are going to be the testable implications of the model that they happen to be uh, interested in. Uh, the first of the, of the propositions that's going to come out, at least of the model, is that what we would expect is that uh, breastfeeding, or that the number of months that a child uh, is going to be breastfed, is just simply going to be increasing in the birth order. Now, does everybody know what we mean when we refer to uh, an individual or a child's birth order, just kind of where you are in terms of the number of children. Uh, so at least here, almost all of you, are all of you only children? And, okay, so there it's not a very complicated thing. Uh, you are the first of one. Uh, in my household, you know, I was the third of four. Um, so anyway, so this just means is going to just mean where the child happens to be in terms of the birth order. And all that this is saying, at least from the perspective of the model, is that the kind of the later you are in terms of where you are in terms of that birth order, the more months that you are uh, going to go ahead and be uh, breastfed. And the intuition, at least in terms of, of the model here, is that you know, the mother kind of desired future fertility and that for every household, I mean, unless you know, you're living again in an environment where you're constrained or restricted in terms of your choice, uh, in terms of the number of children that you uh, happen to have, is that you know, certainly that the mother's desired fertility is certainly going to decline the more children that the family happens to have. So that what that means then is that probably for every household there's going to be some kind of desired number of children, but clearly the later you are in that birth order, the nearer you are again to the desired number of households, which means that less likely there's going to be more children, which means that you're much more likely then uh, to be, uh, receive again uh, more breastfeeding. Okay. Um, the second kind of proposition that's going to fall out of the model is that at any birth order, so it doesn't matter whether you're the first child, second child, third child, it doesn't really matter where you are in terms of that order, uh, that the child is certainly going to be more likely to be breastfed, first of all, if the child happens to be male or more of his or her siblings are male. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, that you're going to be more likely to be breastfed if you are a male. Now, why would that be true? What would be the intuition? So why would boys, regardless of the birth order, be more likely to be breastfed than girls? 
That's right, so son preference. I, there's a preference for boys. I want boys to survive. In this case, that these households know that breastfeeding, in some sense, they may not know all the, the, the science of it, but they know that breastfeeding is good. So if it happens to be a son, they want to make all these investments that are going to ensure that that son lives. So going to be more breastfeeding. All right, so all else equal, regardless of where you happen to be in the, breast, in the, in the birth order, much more likely that you're going to, you'll receive, uh, uh, much more likely you're going to be breastfed. And the second thing is that uh, a child is more likely to be breastfed the more of his or her older siblings are male. Now, what's the logic there? That's exactly right. So households have, a des so from the point of view of the household, there's a desired number of children that they want, a desired number of males that they're going to want. And even here in the context of India, that the typical kind of, I, kind of household size, desired household size, was typically four, often kind of two and two, you know, when they kind of do these interviews in terms of what they want, two sons, you know, two daughter, you know, kinds of things. And so certainly the more his or her siblings are male, it just means that they've had more children, more of them are male, they're nearer to whatever their desire happens to be, less likely that they're going to be having future children, uh, and in that regard then, um, much more likely then that the mother's going to be willing to continue to breastfeed and is not concerned about having more children and uh, stopping breastfeeding in order to try to facilitate having more children. And then proposition three, the other one that's going to be important here is that, well, where would we expect to see kind of the largest gap in terms of breastfeeding in children in terms of the birth order, so the largest gap in terms of breastfeeding between boys and girls? That's actually going to occur kind of middle in terms of the, of the birth order for exactly the reasons that we've gone ahead and that we've articulated here. There's kind of two kind of opposing things that are kind of uh, going here. Early on, there, you wouldn't expect much of a difference. Later on, there's not going to be much of a difference, but in the middle. That's where we're going to go ahead and we're going to see then the largest differences in terms of the breastfeeding between the boys and the girls. Uh, there's a fourth proposition, but just this much has a lot to do about the desired family size. Uh, slightly less important for our purposes and just kind of for reasons of time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and we'll just kind of, uh, uh, just kind of, we'll ignore that or we won't devote any time to that. So the key data that she's going to be using, that they're going to be using here uh, is this, uh, these waves then of this kind of national fertility and health survey uh, that gets carried out in India every kind of six or seven years. And so here all that she's going to be doing, all that they're doing is they're just looking for differences, just kind of just some summary statistics that they're going to be looking at for differences in terms of things such as breastfeeding, which is what we're going to be interested in, uh, depending upon where the child happens to be in terms of the uh, breastfeeding. So this is, you can immediately see here some differences emerge almost immediately between children depending upon where they are in the birth order and that those children that are later in the birth order uh, typically again have slightly more a month more of breastfeeding than with those kids again who are earlier in the birth order. Um, what else do we happen to see? Uh, again, certainly not much in the Indian context in terms of differences in terms of the sex ratio uh, that we happen to, to observe in terms of the percentage of males. One thing that you can also see, though, that I think that in this table that's a little bit important, and I don't know that you can, do you have the slides? I saw that some of you had the slides. Um, this may be a little bit difficult to see. Um, and maybe I can just tell you, and then I can ask you uh, if you can. Uh, OK. Here, this is in terms of mother's years of schooling. So this is five, uh, like 5.5. Here, this is uh, 2.4. Anybody have any idea of what this is possibly picking up? Differences in schooling? What this might possibly be picking up? So this is differences, again, in the, mother of sco in the, in the schooling of the mother between those kids who happen to be uh, first or second children versus those that are third or fourth or fifth. Or sixth. More on education reviews than those. All right, so it's picking up that. But what else? So what other kind of dimension possibly in the Indian context? And it's also, a, you'd probably see the same thing in China, although not with respect to birth order. But what else is that probably picking up in terms of where these households are? Where would you expect to see differences in terms of educational attainment? Where in developing countries? 
do you often see the largest differences in educational attainment emerge? I maybe heard someone say it? Differences between urban and rural, right? So typically individuals who grow up in the cities have access to much better education than what individuals who happen to be growing up in the countryside. That's actually true for boys as well as girls. Uh, it's often the case that fertility is often tied to levels of income of households and individuals, right? And as well as the levels of, of, of human capital. So here in part, some of this is just kind of picking up some of these differences that we happen to be observing in this sample. It's including both urban, you know, w women who are living in urban areas, uh, but it's also uh, including uh, women who are living in rural areas as well. So here you can see some of these differences here, and that you can see that there's a, just a much higher percentage, or a slightly higher percentage, of those households where the children that they're picking up, where the birth order is greater than two, are in rural areas, just re reflecting these differences in fertility decisions that we happen to observe between the city versus the countryside, where in the countryside, households typically lower income, individuals lower levels of human capital, women with lower levels of human capital, uh, usually having, again, much larger families, uh, having more children. And some of that is going to be to try to compensate possibly for slightly higher levels of infant mortality uh, in the countryside than in the cities. But this is just kind of picking up uh, some of these differences. So all that the, this table here is just trying to go ahead and to kind of pick up uh, some of these differences that we've gone ahead, uh, just some of these kind of first order things. Here that what we have is that the first thing that they're interested in doing is just trying to take a look at the link between the birth order and between the breastfeeding. And this is just the results of a very simple regression of where, you're trying, where they're trying to take a look in terms of you know, what's the number of months that these kids happen to be breastfed depending upon where they happen to be uh, in the birth order. You know, are you the first, second, third, or fourth? And then controlling uh, for a number of other household uh, level variables as well as then uh, other kinds of fixed effects. And everything here is kind of normalized relative to the first child. But you can clearly see that just as kind of what, as their first proposition went ahead and, and suggested, you clearly see then that those kids, again, that are kind of later in the birth order, that the average number of months that they uh, are going to be breastfed is, in fact, increasing. So that you see this in this very kind of simple, ordinary least squares regression. They also do some uh, kind of hazard regressions. And you see the exact same thing. So clearly, being born kind of later, later in the birth order, again, in general, is very good in terms of breastfeeding, which is also probably going to be good in terms of uh, infant mortality as well. And that infant mortality in general should be declining uh, in that regard. The next thing that they do then is to take a look, and I'm just kind of simplifying just a little bit. Just, I'm trying to go through things just to kind of highlight kind of the key things, is to take a look at the breastfeeding as a function uh, of gender. So here, just simply breastfeeding as a function uh, of gender, you can see from these very kind of simple results that if you happen to be a male, that you know, on average that you're going to be, uh, receive almost you know, four tenths of, uh, of a month uh, more breastfeeding than if you were a girl. That they also run these hazard regressions, and here what the hazard regressions you know, are implying uh, is that you're about 10% less likely, again, to be weaned in any given month. And weaned, just all that that means is that they stop breastfeeding. So you're much, breastfeeding is much more likely to continue, again, over time if you happen to be a male than what you happen to be a female, or alternatively, uh, you're much less likely to be weaned in any given month if you happen to be a male relative to a female. The other thing that they also do here is that they're going to go ahead and that they're going to take a look in terms of how these effects, again, are going to differ depending on whether or not the household already has a son. And so here that what they, what they find is that mothers who already have a son uh, actually increase the, the current breastfeeding by two-eighths of a month. So if the household already has at least one son, which means that the household is in some sense getting kind of nearer to what the desired kind of sex composition is going to be, then in that case then individuals are going to go ahead, in this case it could be girls, it could be boys, it doesn't make any difference, are also then going to be much more likely to go ahead and to receive then uh, additional breastfeeding as well. So what that tells us here then, that as we kind of take a look at these households and these decisions that are being made, that this gender composition matters. That you know, in terms of that household, that where you are in the birth order, the number of males or number of brothers that you may already have, these things are going to be extremely important in terms of the differences within any household you know, that we're going to go ahead and that we're going to observe uh, with respect to these households in terms of uh, differences in breastfeeding. Now, 
So what does this suggest then? So that if you were a girl, where in that birth order would you like to be? So suppose that we were talking about a household that had four kids. If you were a girl, where would you like to be? That's right, there's certainly three or four. So if, from the point of view of that household, uh, the desired number of kids was four, and that what you wanted was two boys or two girls, well, if both of those first kids were boys, household would be absolutely delighted. They already had the sons that they wanted, and in that case then, uh, they'd, you know, they'd go ahead and they'd have a girl, and they wouldn't be in too big of a hurry to go ahead and to have one more kid to try to ensure that they had you know, at least one son or, or two sons. Clearly, in that particular case, that in terms of the luck of the draw, and it's just, just the luck of the draw, having brothers that would have been born uh, before you would have been a very good thing in order to try to ensure then that uh, breastfeeding, that you were breastfed longer and um, uh, ultimately benefited from uh, the kinds of things, again, that we've been, uh, been talking about. Uh, finally, what you, they're going to do is that they're going to allow for these kind of birth order and gender interactions. They're just interested in terms of trying to find out where in the birth order these differences between boys and girls are going to be uh, the largest. And so here, this is going to be the, the relationship between breastfeeding and birth order for boys, birth order and breastfeeding, uh, I mean, for girls and for boys, and in terms of the differences, and that you can see this kind of inverted U shape, which is just the difference in the number of, of months, again, that boys are breastfed relative to girls, depending upon where you happen to be in the birth order. And so in this particular case, you know, clearly that down here the differences are going to be much smaller. But actually, I think that if you're the first, I mean, if, you're, if the family happens to have a girl first, given that the expectation is they're going to have at least three other kids, the differences, again, is, aren't all that different in this particular case compared to if, they, if the first child happened to be a son. But you can see kind of the quadratic nature uh, of that relationship. So it's kind of an inverted U. And their model, in fact, predicts, again, these kinds of low, the lowest differences that, uh, for you know, the uh, kind of the two ends of the, of the birth distribution. Uh, the final thing here that I want to talk about is just simply these links then between the breastfeeding and the child mortality. Because this is, in some sense, kind of the important and the novel link that this paper uh, is interested in. Because what it's trying to argue here is that there's all kinds of advantages to the breastfeeding. It works through particular uh, channels. And so what they're going to do here is that they're going to take a look at this, the likelihood or just kind of child mortality between the ages of 12 and 36 months. But remember that we said that there could be an important kind of spatial dimension to it and that we would expect breastfeeding to be a lot more important uh, in areas where households don't have access to clean water, where households lack uh, piped water. So they're going to go and they're going to divide their sample uh, into those households that, have, that lack piped water those households that happen to have pipe water. And lo and behold, that what they find is that in those, household, in those uh, parts of India where households happen to have piped water, so households can have uh, kind of water coming into their homes, there's basically no, there's no effect at all in this particular case. There's kind of no benefits to that breastfeeding uh, on infant mortality. But on the other hand, that in those areas where these households don't have access to those kinds of investments, that's exactly where we're going to see the consequence then uh, of the uh, number of months that children are breastfeeding to infant mortality. So the channel here then of breastfeeding, we believe that breastfeeding is good, but it's going to be especially important in those areas where households don't have uh, access to uh, clean water uh, and, and thus are going to have to use that you know, water, as we said, for in the making of, of, um, of um, a baby formula uh, you know, for the kids. So what are the results in kind of, just in summary, just kind of briefly, what are they telling us? Well, certainly that in these environments, then sons are going to be about 1% less likely to die you know, through this particular channel uh, and going to be consistent with the breastfeeding advantage, that it's going to be linked again to where you happen to be then uh, in, the, uh, in the birth order. It's going to be especially important in those localities where uh, there is uh, pipe water, um, or at least it, localities with pipe water, there's basically not going to be much of an effect and that what their results are suggesting, I guess I was a bit high when I talked about it at the outset, that this kind of breastfeeding gender gap, so the advantages, again, that breastfeeding may have, that this may help to explain about one-sixth uh, of the excess femur mortality that we happen to observe in India. So the nice thing then, again, about this paper is that it's addressing an issue that's important, this issue of infant mortality. Uh, it's trying to identify a potentially important channel uh, 
through which um, infant mortality may be affected. It's a very kind of nice model that tries to look at these dynamic decisions that households happen to be making with respect to uh, investments, I mean, in this case, breastfeeding and how it's going to be tied to uh, households' objectives with respect to how many kids they want to have and what the desired sex ratio is. So here, clearly, where you are in that birth order is going to be important. You need a bit of a dynamic model to look at those kinds of things. Uh, and so all of those things are being kind of combined here, along with just a lot of robustness tests uh, with these papers to, I think, to make a result that's been fairly compelling uh, and that people have gone ahead and, and, and made note of. So a very nice paper, again, uh, in that regard. Well, the third paper that I want to take a look at is a paper um, that is also, in some sense, kind of in this literature is a bit of a, of, a, of a classic. It's a paper now that's actually 20 years old, but it's a paper that was done by Chris Udry. Uh, Chris used to be at Northwestern, went to Yale, now moving back to, uh, to Northwestern. Uh, but it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a paper that, in some sense, tries to go ahead and kind of get at uh, or to look at an, an assumption, kind of a fundamental assumption uh, of that collective model that we had gone ahead and that we had taken a look at. And so if you remember kind of when we were talking about the collective model, that one of the important assumptions of that collective model is that we assume that the resource allocation decisions within the household uh, are Pareto efficient. So here we happen to have this household, they happen to have a set of resources, they have to make decisions how to allocate these resources you know, to kind of competing uses. So what we're effectively assuming is that the household is allocating those resources uh, in a very efficient way to try to go ahead and to kind of maximize or increase the, the total size of the pie. And then kind of conditional on that, the household has to be making these decisions then about uh, how to allocate uh, these resources then, uh, amongst its members. But as Chris goes ahead and kind of points out, um, you know, certainly in the paper, that we can imagine just a lot of other kinds of setups, certainly in the context of non-cooperative games, where this assumption may not hold. And that when, before this paper was done, you know, over 20 years ago, kind of one of the key assumptions of the model uh, had not been tested. And so this is kind of one of the first papers in the developing country context that was trying to go ahead and to test this, in some sense, kind of important assumption that was underlying these models that we were using uh, to make sense uh, of these households. So the context is going to be uh, Africa. And that one of the important features of Africa and agriculture in Africa that's going to allow them to take advantage or to be able to look at these issues is that in African agriculture, some of the plots are going to be farmed or going to be controlled by women. Some of the plots are going to be farmed and controlled uh, by men. And this is just a very kind of common feature uh, in African society. And in part, again, we'll talk a little bit in terms of why that's the case, but in marriage, so that when women get married uh, in India, that a very important part of their dowry that they come into the marriage with is, in fact, land that their families will have gone ahead and given them. So that in these African households, there's going to be plots of land that are effectively going to be kind of owned or controlled by women in the household. There's also going to be uh, land or plots that are going to be controlled by men uh, in the household. Now, the kind of standard separation results that we talked about in the context of the unitary model a little bit ago is that these production decisions that households are making should be independent of preferences. So if we thought in the context of, of these households, even if the preferences of husbands and wives happen to, to differ, that the allocation decisions, the production decisions, how to go ahead and to allocate these resources across these plots of agriculture that are controlled by men, controlled by women, the preferences just shouldn't be important uh, in that regard. And so that's kind of the standard separation result of household models would go ahead and, and predict that. Um, and so that what that also implies then is that if there's Pareto efficiency, so if these households in the context of agriculture are allocating resources efficiently across these plots, is that what we would expect then is that the differences that we observe across these plots in terms of output, kind of output per unit of land, so yields, or the inputs that are being used uh, on these uh, plots, that these differences should only depend on plot characteristics, how good the land happens to be, the quality of the land, but we shouldn't expect it to depend on gender. So the intuition here is that if we happen to have two plots of land, suppose that those two plots of land were exactly the same size, that these plots of land were of exactly the same kind of quality, these two plots of land were identical in every respect, and we had a household that was making a decision about how to allocate their inputs across these two plots that were identical in every respect, what would we expect? Two plots identical in every 
respect, what would we expect to be true about the household's resource allocation, input decisions with respect to those two plots? They should be exactly the same. So if that's one plot and that's the other plot, they're identical in size, they're identical in quality, they're identical in every respect, that the amount of inputs that I'm going to be applying to that plot should be exactly equal to the inputs that I'm applying to that plot. There should be no differences at all, again, assuming that I've been able to go ahead and I'm able to control, control again for you know, the quality differences in those plots. No differences in terms of the uh, inputs, in terms of the input allocation. And by allocating those inputs equally across those two plots, what am I effectively doing? What am I equalizing? So I'm going to be equalizing the marginal products of the allocation of those inputs to those two plots. And so I'm effectively going to be kind of maximizing, again, the uh, total size uh, of the pie. Right? So the other way to maybe to kind of go in to say it is that here I have these two plots that are identical in every respect, that I'm assuming that, that the input choices that the households are facing are same, that the prices or the shadow prices that the households are facing are effectively the same. So the input decisions that the households should be making with respect to those two plots should be exactly the same as well. And gender should not be important at all in that regard in terms of the decisions that the households are making. And so what Chris is going to go ahead and do in this, uh, in this paper is that what he's going to be doing is looking for these differences in these input decisions and kind of output uh, results, again, within households um, that are going to be controlled between plots that are going to be controlled by males as well as households uh, plots are going to be controlled by females. So within these African households, there's going to be some plots that are going to be controlled and farmed by women, by the wife. There's going to be other plots that are going to be controlled and farmed by the husbands. That what we would expect, all else equal, if we lived in a world of Pareto efficiency, that there shouldn't be any difference once we've gone ahead and that we've kind of controlled for heterogeneity in these plots with respect to quality, uh, there shouldn't be any differences with respect to yields and input choices in those plots. Shadow prices should effectively be the same. And insofar as the shadow prices that both the husbands and the wives are facing are the same, we should be, we should be observing identical input choices that in turn should map themselves into, into, into the same uh, output, output outcomes or yields between the plots um, that, uh, uh, as well. And so this paper was one of the first, again, to be able to kind of take a look at this. So the empirics in some levels you know, isn't overly, overly you know, complicated in this regard, but it is a paper you know, where the data requirements are in some sense relatively uh, intense. I mean, they're intense in terms of the kind of data uh, that you need. So in order to be able to do this, first of all, is that you need to have data at the plot level. So for agriculture, usually when you go out and you do a household level survey, is that what you do is, and you want to ask the household about what they're doing in agriculture, is you find out what the total amount of land that the household happens to have. You may ask some things, again, about the quality of the land. You'll ask them about the crops that they happen to be growing and how much they happen to harvest. And then you'll ask them about their input use. How much fertilizer did you use? How much labor did you use? You know, how much did you hire in at capital services? So you're asking them these kind of input decisions about all of their agricultural operations. And then you're collecting information kind of on the aggregate kind of outcome from all of their uh, agricultural operations. But you typically don't do it at a plot by plot level just simply because the time requirements are so intense, especially in the, in the context of a setting you know, where individuals may have five plots, may ten plots. So just imagine now for every plot that a household was farming, you had to ask it these very detailed input-output decisions or input decisions on that particular plot as well as collect all this information about the quality of the plots and then the output. So here the key uh, uh, regression uh, that Chris is going to be running, this is just going to be, at least initially it's going to be output, later on he's going to be looking at uh, input choice. This is just going to be a vector of plot attributes. And these are going to be all these things that are going to be capturing the quality of the plot. And there's just an awful lot of what I would call agronomic information about the quality of that particular plot. It's soil, organic matter, all kinds of things that are going to be extremely important in terms of the quality uh, of the plot. G here is just going to be gender. And then lambda is going to be a household crop and your fixed effect uh, regression, I mean fixed, fixed effect. So what we're effectively going to be doing here that in this kind of regression, in this analysis, that what we're going to want to be doing is that we're going to be want to, within a household, we're going to, be want, we're going to want to compare outcomes on two plots, one that happens to be farmed by the husband, one that happens to be farmed by the wife, 
that are going to be farmed again in the same year where they happen to be growing the same crop. So you can kind of see what kind of the, the, the level of detail at which we're doing this and the nature of the comparison that we're going to be doing, comparing within household, husbands and wives growing the same crop within the same year, and we're going to be looking at the input and the output, input decisions and then the output uh, consequences. So the, in some sense, kind of the exclusion restriction that is being tested in this paper is the extent to which gamma happens to be zero. You know, do we find that gender, do we find that the gender of the person who happens to be farming that plot, uh, is it zero? And so certainly rejection here, that if we happen to find that the output or the input uh, uh, outcomes, uh, in fact, are going to be tied for gender, once we've gone ahead and we've controlled for all of these other things, is that what it's certainly going to suggest then uh, would certainly some, some kind of non-separability in the context of these household models. Right? So that's what's going to be kind of important. So the data that he's going to be using is going to be household panel data uh, from Burkina Faso. And so the test is going to depend, as I said at the outset, just this ability uh, for Chris to be able to control for all these differences in, in land and quality. And this really imposes a very high bar on the data. There's just not an awful lot of household level surveys uh, that are devoting an awful lot of attention to, to land quality. And it's primarily because that's not the primary purpose uh, through which these household surveys are, are being asked to go ahead and to, and to serve. And so there's a number of descriptive tables uh, in the paper. Uh, we won't go through them, but let me just, they, they, he, there are a few things that are going to be uh, important. First is kind of document these differences in output per hectare and input intensity by gender. Just kind of summary statistics look to see just you know, kind of on average what these things happen to look at. And then in terms of the potential reasons for the differences that we may observe in terms of the input choices as well as the output, uh, the output or the yields on these plots, there's any one a number of things that are going to be important. One of the reasons that we may observe differences in input choices or differences in yields, it just could be differences in land quality. And suppose that we went ahead and found that on plots that were farmed by women, maybe on average they're just of lower quality. Well, if they happen to be on lower quality, then all else equal, we would expect to see lower input use. We'd also expect to see lower yields uh, on those prices. Uh, it may also be the case, on the other hand, that the differences that we're observing in terms of the input intensity could just be reflecting differences in shadow prices, differences in the price of capital relative to the cost of labor, prices of intermediate input. So there could be differences in the shadow prices uh, for the inputs that are being used in agriculture, differences in the shadow prices uh, that are facing men versus women. And suppose that you thought that in the context of agriculture, that what you needed to do is that you needed to finance, you needed to borrow uh, in order to be able to buy the intermediate inputs that were being used, again, in agriculture. Well, if women maybe have a more difficult time in terms of borrowing, differences in the shadow price uh, of capital, that could contribute to differences in terms of uh, input intensity. Uh, it may also be the case that reflecting all of these things, there could be differences in the crop choices that they happen to be making as well. So crops are going to differ in terms of their factor intensity, they're going to differ in terms of uh, their suitability with certain kinds of land, so these things uh, could be uh, relatively important as well. And so the first thing that he does is just try to go ahead and to try to kind of describe, just kind of capture these kinds of differences, uh, not the shadow prices, but try to capture these differences uh, through these summary statistics. Um, I think this is also so small that I can't, I can't even, I can't read it. So that's, again, my mistake. But what the purpose here is that the first thing that he wants to, to go ahead and to do is to go ahead and, and to try to take a look. He's going to look at, first of all, he's going to look at differences in yields. And that are there differences in output per unit of land on these plots that happen to be controlled by uh, women relative to men? And that in these regressions, that what's important, he's going to control for all of these attributes of the plots. He's going to control for plot size. Uh, he's going to control for certain kinds of things about the topography. Uh, here, I think it, that says maybe soil types. So there's all th kinds of things, again, about the soil and the land, the size of the plot, uh, that he's going to go and that he's going to control for. Uh, he's first, uh, this is kind of year crop effects. This is going to be for all crops. He's going to do some things where he's going to look at crops separately. So I think this is millet, and maybe that is uh, sorghum. Uh, here this is going to be for vegetables, and this is going to be a regression where he's going to be looking at differences in yields measured in terms of uh, value terms, the value of output per unit of land. 
what all of these are telling us is that when you go ahead and that when you control, controlling for all of these differences in the land, that uh, the plots that the men versus the women happen to be using, that what we're finding is that those plots that are controlled by women, on average yields, output per unit of land is about 30% lower. Right? So that's kind of the first important finding here. And what kind of started this is that our intuition was, or at least the kind of the predictions were, is that all else equal is that we wouldn't expect any differences. That once we went ahead and that we controlled for differences in terms of input quality, that what this the key kind of assumption of the collective model of Pareto efficiency is that what we would have expected is that inputs to be allocated across these plots in such a way as to equalize the marginal returns. And as, if we're happy to be comparing now plots that are identical in every respect, that should have been reflected in terms of similarities, no differences in terms of output per unit of land. So we're going to see these differences here in terms of output per unit of land. What would you expect to be true in terms of differences in terms of inputs per unit of land? So this is outputs. What's going to be true, would you expect to be true now for inputs? So if we kind of wanted to rationalize, so even before we do the regressions, what's going to be true? So if output per unit of land happens to be lower, and we're controlling here for land quality, why is it that output per unit of land is going to be lower? That's right. You're going to expect that inputs per unit of land are also going to be lower as well. So that's the next thing that he's going to go ahead and that he's going to do here. And I think that that's, yes, and again, my apology, can't read it very well, but almost ident identical regressions, male labor, so the amount of male labor per hectare, uh, female labor uh, per hectare, child labor, non-household labor, manure, and there may be some other things as well. So, Primarily with seeing these differences and with respect to uh, the amount of labor uh, that is being used per unit of land, controlling for these inputs, uh, as well as manure. And that with the exception of one input, is that what you observe is that on those plots that are being controlled by women, you find lower levels of input use. Less male labor, less child labor, uh, less non-household labor, so households might be able to go out and to hire labor uh, to help them farm. Uh, less kind of manure, uh, so in Chinese, nung jia fei, so kind of nung jia fei is being used per unit uh, of land as well, and that, I guess that's the primary fertilizer that happens to be used. The only thing that you see, and it's not all that statistically significant, the only thing that you see where there's a, a positive difference in terms of inputs, uh, in terms of plots that are being controlled by women, is in terms of female labor. And you see slightly more labor supplied by women on plots that are controlled by women. But all else equal that you go ahead and you see these differences. So that when we go ahead and when we take a look at these input choices that are being made, and assuming again that we're able to in a fairly completely control for all of these differences in plot size, topography, soil type, all of which should be influencing the input choice, right? kind of the returns to using labor and fertilizer. We'd expect no differences. We're seeing differences. So the primary reason that we're observing differences in terms of output per unit of land on these plots that are being controlled by women compared to men is, in fact, because of differences in input intensity, that there is less of these inputs, less of the labor, less of this fertilizer that is being applied to these plots that are controlled by women compared to those that are being uh, farmed by, by men. Now, what does that suggest? So if we happen to observe then, we have these plots identical in every respect, plots controlled by men, plots controlled by women, identical in every respect. What does this tell us insofar as that we're observing these differences in either yields or differences in input intensity across these plots that otherwise are identical, what does this tell us that in principle the household could do? So in principle, what's the implication here? So remember that we're interested in looking at this issue of Pareto efficiency. 
So I think what we've kind of come to the conclusion is it doesn't look as if this input choice on the part of this household is Pareto efficient. So what's the Im Pareto improvement? So what would have to be the input that we'd want to reallocate in this particular case from, from, from women to men? What's going to be the key input? So that given that output per unit of land is higher on men's plots and men are using, in this case, more uh, inputs per unit of land, if it was just land, what would we want to do? That's exactly it. That what we'd want to do is that we'd, holding everything else equal, that what we'd want to do is that we'd want to reallocate land that's currently farmed by women, we reallocate some of that to men. And by doing so, that would help to achieve, again, a Pareto improvement. It would enable us to kind of equalize yields, equalize productivity, marginal products of the input use across. Alternatively, if we couldn't move the land, right, we couldn't reallocate land, what else could we do? That's right, we could reallocate the inputs. And so here, in which direction would the inputs go? That's exactly right, that we would go ahead and we'd reallocate you know, these inputs, so on a given piece of land right now, lots of inputs being used on male plots, plots of the same quality that are being used by women. We see less of those inputs being used, which is implying that the marginal product, again, of those inputs is going to be high. So what that implies then is we could just, if we reallocated those intermediate inputs from male control to female, we could also increase the yields, equalize the yields, increase the size of the pie. So clearly what these results are suggesting here in this particular case is that by either this reallocation of the inputs, again, it could either be the land, again, from the women to the husbands, uh, or the intermediate inputs from the husband to the, wis uh, to the, uh, to the women, you, know, you could go ahead and you could improve or you could increase then uh, the total output that the household happens to be improving. So clearly what we're observing here in terms of the kind of the allocation is not Pareto efficient. So that kind of the, the neat thing then about this paper is that not only does it try to kind of document this thing to see that this kind of fundamental kind of assumption about Pareto efficiency uh, is not being, uh, being achieved, that what it's also asking then is that, well, why is this the case? You know, what is it about the particular institutional setup that we happen to be looking at uh, that's preventing either the land being reallocated from women to men or, or alternatively for this reallocation of the variable inputs from, um, uh, from plots that are controlled by men to, um, uh, uh, to women in this particular case? All right. So in other words, kind of what is the impediment to mutually advantageous trades? So clearly it would, it would appear to be that there's all kinds of room, again, to trade to occur between uh, the husbands and wives that are advantageous to both, but these two things, again, aren't going on. Well, what he's going to focus here on is the issue of property rights and the nature of property rights that exist certainly in Africa uh, in this particular uh, setting. And it's going to be you know, an important kind of dimension, again, of property rights and insecurity of property rights. So this is a, a paper, one of the first papers that you know, Chris had done where he tried to link some of these outcomes that we happen to observe with respect to resource allocation to issues of property rights. Here there was a gender dimension. Uh, there was a paper that he did maybe four or five years ago um, uh, with Marcus Goldstein, also interested in issues about property rights, allocation of property rights how property rights are influencing decisions, again, in agriculture. But there, there was much more of a political economy dimension to the property rights and uh, how those were influencing the security uh, that households enjoyed and thus the decisions and the inputs and the output decisions that households were, uh, were, were making. Well, here, one possibility, again, might be is that, well, look it. We've just gone ahead and argued that one thing that could happen is that, well, maybe in order to kind of achieve Pareto efficiency, women could go ahead and kind of reallocate their land. Well, if you remember what the entire purpose of endowing these women with the land to begin with was, this land was part of their dowries. This was land that when they were married that their families went ahead and gave them. Now, what's the reason that families usually endow their daughters with dowries? So why is it that when women get married, that their families, again, are giving them these dowries, that they're endowing them with these assets. What's the reason? Yes. 
Okay, well, it certainly it could maybe increase their bargaining power again in the household. But what are the parents concerned about in doing that? Pardon me? Okay, they're going to make them more competitive in the marriage market, but even at a simpler level, by endowing them with these assets, what are they going to help to do? So they're going to be able to, in some sense, either to try to help to protect or promote their well-being. That they're going to provide them with these resources that they happen to control, where they are, in some sense, the residual claimants to, where they're the beneficiaries of. It's going to provide them an asset. It's going to provide them some control over resources, resources that they can then go ahead and use and spend as they happen to see fit. So in that regard, one of the reasons why parents endow daughters with dowries I mean, all these other things are, in some sense, important. But the parents are ultimately concerned about the daughter's welfare. You want to make your daughter maybe more attractive in the, in the marriage market? Well, clearly, maybe you're also concerned about the bride price that may go you know, to the family rather than to the daughter. But a lot of it, again, is about the daughter. And it's, they're about an intergenerational uh, kind of, uh, of transfer in this particular case. So here in this, in this African context, you know, these women are, you know, when they get married as part of their dowries, you know, they have this land, and this land is, in some sense, being used to try to uh, kind of help them you know, in a variety of ways and to help to maintain their consumption and possibly increase their, their bargaining uh, power. You know, the concern here, well, maybe they could go ahead and they could rent the land to their husband, thus entitle them to that stream of income related to the land. Well, maybe one of the concerns here in Africa and certainly in the context where a lot of the property rights are almost communal or informal, where who uses the land in some sense kind of ultimately has the, uh, the claim to it. Maybe you're going to be concerned in this particular case that if you rented the land to your husband, that you may ultimately lose it again in that regard. Maybe at some point, maybe you and your husband have a contract, and then it calls for you. You're going to let your husband use the land. He's going to pay you so much e each year. Well, maybe at some point the husband just decides, I'm not going to pay you anymore. This is not your land. This is my land. So you know, in that regard, the woman may be concerned that if she rents her land to her husband, she may ultimately go ahead and to, to lose the land. Uh, at the same time, well, the woman in principle could go ahead and could sell the land to her husband. That could also be a way in which the land could go ahead and could be uh, reallocated in this regard. But here in this African context, there just, not may, there just may not be a lot of other assets that if I sold the land and I got cash, well, cash just may not be the most securest of assets. Uh, it could be exposed to inflation and all other kinds of things. It may, may not maintain uh, its value uh, particularly well. So in that regard, I may not want to sell the land to my husband, in this case, to try to, uh, to eliminate or to try to deal with the issue, because I'm going to be concerned then that, well, I just don't have other assets. There's not other assets out there that I'm going to be able to hold. They're going to provide me kind of, as I look forward, a very secure kind of stream uh, of income. Um, and so here, I think that kind of the bottom line of this paper is that if we're looking at this kind of Pareto inefficiency, you know, why is it in the context of these households where our prior would have been, oh yes, these households are Pareto efficient, they allocate resources efficiently you know, in this regard, uh, that it may ultimately be all kinds of market imperfections, imperfections in property rights here that may be the source of the problem why we don't see the equalization that we, have, that we might otherwise expect, again, within these, these households. So this paper is, again, is very nice because it's kind of tackling, looking at this kind of critical assumption, again, to these models, uh, finding a very nice context in which to go ahead and to take a look at it, to be able to show that this Pareto efficiency doesn't hold, and then in turn, I think, to tell a reasonable story as to why it doesn't hold. What's the nature of the constraints uh, in this particular case that may be preventing uh, either women in these households deciding to sell their land, again, or alternatively, uh, to either rent their land or sell their land, and why those may be very imperfect substitutes, uh, and why women may decide not to do so. So the imperfection just goes ahead and persists. Right. So that's the uh, the Udry paper. Okay. How are we doing on? Okay. I got about. Oh, I have until one. Okay. I don't have a lot of time that that's left, but I think you all have access. They all have access to the notes, don't they? They will. Yeah. They will. Okay. I'll post. Okay. You know the last two papers that I. I I take a look at, you know, have to do with decisions that parents make uh, about investments in their kids uh, and what's often known as compensating uh, investments. Uh, over a child's lifetime, uh, parents make multiple investments. 
So one of the, you know, we've talked about they'll make these investments in their kids very early on in their life in terms of their health. Later on, I mean, subsequently, they'll make investments in schooling and in education. So those are going to be uh, important investments. It's also the case that once the child gets a little bit older, that there's going to be other ways in which households and parents may transfer resources to their children. Um, they can be resources that can uh, be transferred often at the time of marriage. Marriage is a very common time in which, in which parents transfer resources to their kids. Uh, here in the Chinese context, uh, if, you, if you are a boy and you want to increase the likelihood that you get married, what do you need? You need, yes, you need an apartment or you need a house, so that can be extremely important. That's true in the cities. It's also uh, true uh, in the countryside as well. It's also the case that parents are often going to make, even after you get married, parents can make decisions, can make transfers again to their kids much later on in their life as well. And often that these transfers are going to occur even before the parent goes ahead uh, and dies. That, you know, their child may be at some certain point in their life, positive, well, more likely like a negative shock, and parents may decide to help their kids. So parents make all kinds of investments in their kids at various kinds of points in time. These differences that often the investments that parents happen to make earlier into their uh, kid's life, that they may differ between their children. So for you know, all kinds of reasons, I mean, even if the kids, even if you thought for a moment that the kids were alike in every respect, <coughs> so I'm simplifying here, but let's just imagine that the kids are alike in every respect in terms of genetic ability. So even if the kids were identical in every respect, there could still be differences, again, in the kids. Maybe there are differences in genetic ability. Maybe some of kids that you have, maybe just some are just slightly smarter than others. And so if some kids happen to be slightly smarter than others, maybe you're going to be slightly more inclined to invest more in their education than in other kids. Well, then the question is, is that for your kids, if you've invested more in the education of some kids than others, later on in life, what's that going to result in? So suppose that I have two kids. Make life real simple. Suppose I have two boys. Maybe these two boys kind of differ in terms of maybe how smart they are, how smart they do in school, how well they learn. So who am I going to make more investment in, at least with respect to schooling and education? All right, the son who seems smarter and does better. What's that going to mean in terms of differences in, in, their li in kind of income later on in their lifetime? That's right, that what I would generally expect because of the positive returns to schooling. One child has more schooling than the other. That child that got more schooling is going to be much better off, again, in the future than his brother. Well, then the question is that insofar as that there are differences in your children in terms of these kinds of realizations later on in life, do you make compensating investments? So do you try to go ahead and try to compensate for the differences in terms of the outcomes of your children? So, here we have a kind of a dynamic problem that the household happens to be facing. They're making these investments early on in their kid's life. These are going to lead to certain kinds of outcomes. And that parents later on in life then may try to go ahead and make compensating investments to try to go ahead and to equalize, in some sense, the outcomes of these two children. And so here, again, we kind of talk about uh, this notion of compensating wage differential. And what this paper is trying to do, kind of in the context of a, of a Beck, becker s kind of model, to take a look at the extent to which these households happen to be making uh, these compensating uh, investments. And so here, there's kind of two important dimensions to these parental uh, investments, I guess, that I've gone ahead and talked about. There could be kind of substitutions between alternative forms of investment, kind of humans capital, investments in human capital versus kind of inter vivos transfers. Uh, and there could also just be substitution, again, among siblings. And so the extent to which uh, these investments that uh, parents happen to make, the extent to which they happen to be equalizing. I'll leave it to you to kind of go through this, but the gist of this is that this is a paper that's looking at these decisions in the context of rural China where parents are making multiple investments. They're making multiple investments in their kids and their boys. And so here the paper is primarily concerned about boys. But they first make investments in schooling, where we observe big differences. But the compensating investment happens to be in the marriage market. So if you take a look in terms of rural China, these households, they save six or seven years in order to be able to buy homes for their sons to try to make them more desirable in the marriage market. What this paper is trying to do is to go ahead, both kind of theoretically and empirically, look to see the extent to which households are making compensating investments. I have two boys. 
differences in terms of the educational investment that has been made in those children, do I, as a parent, through the marriage market or through post-marital transfers, do I try to compensate for those differences in the educational investments that were made uh, much earlier in life? And this is one of those cases of where both the theory, kind of working out issues of functional form, identification, uh, the value of a little bit of structure, again, in the model, or at least in the, in the estimation, become a little bit important. I'm just going to kind of tell you kind of what the conclusions are. You know, and a lot of what we do in this literature that we tend to do a very simple kind of diff and diff, uh, which kind of manifests itself in the form of kind of a log linear kind of model. So here the log linear model would be kind of post kind of uh, later transfers in life, you know, on education. It turns out that from a theoretical point of view that this kind of log linear model that's implicit in lots of the diff and diff that we do, it really has some unusual behavior kind of implications that are just not very reasonable and that, test, that you can test and just don't hold. But here that what we also find is that our kind of estimate of what we call the compensating coefficient or the marginal compensating coefficient is about one, one half, which means then that parents try to kind of mitigate or offset some of the earnings uh, that we observe with respect to inequality that are related to education, but less than full compensation. So there's differences in the investments that I make in my sons. It results in differences in terms of their lifetime earnings. I'm going to try to offset some of those differences through the investments that I'm going to make in the marriage market, through post-marital transfers, but I'm not going to fully try to uh, offset uh, those differences uh, that uh, they uh, observe. These results, again, also imply that I think this becomes important because of some of the, the behavioral assumptions that come out of the model. Sons, again, ultimately retain less than 100% of their earnings, which is important because it tells us that in the context of these rural households, clearly there's pooling of income that happens to be going on, that sons and their families are pooling income with their parents, um, and so that kind of becomes important for the kind of the, the model that we happen to be using. It's also the case that the intra-household consumption favors the more educated child, so that there is some bias in terms of how these households are allocating their resources to their kids, and that in particular, those kids, again, who happen to be kind of more educated, slightly better educated, for whatever reason, could be genetic, they could work harder, could be other things that are going on, that overall, that those children, more resources are directed uh, towards those children over their lifetime, that's allowing them higher levels of, uh, higher lifetime earnings and a higher standard of living uh, than what their brothers would achieve. And then the question is that why do we observe kind of less than full compensation? One thing, it could just be moral hazard kinds of issues. You know, imagine that you have sons, and so suppose that those sons happen to know that ex ante, if they don't work very hard in school, that they're still going to be just as well off as if they work really hard. There's all kinds of moral hazard issues that are going to be involved here. And so possibly the reason why parents don't fully compensate uh, is because of these issues of moral hazard in some kind of dynamic context. Uh, the other reason may be because of intergenerational exchange. Here by gener intergenerational exchange is that I'm investing in these sons. Later on in life, there's going to be transfers from these sons to the parents. Maybe what I want to do is to, in order to kind of maximize the transfers that I'm going to receive as a parent, maybe I want to go ahead and I want to kind of allocate more of the resources to the more abled son, the son that happens is going to have the higher income earnings, and that's going to facilitate a larger set of transfers later on in life back to me and to my wife. So this, again, looks at it in this kind of particular context. The other paper that I just I want to take a look at and that the slides are for uh, is a fun paper to read in an interesting context that you're all familiar with, uh, is the paper called Sophie's Choice. Have any of you ever heard of this paper? So this is a paper by uh, Lee Hong Bin, uh, who's now at Stanford, and Mark Rosenzweig, and uh, uh, Junsen Zhang, to kind, of, to kind of set this thing up. You know, during the Cultural Revolution, and so this was probably maybe something that your parents went ahead and experienced, is that during the Cultural Revolution that if you were living in the cities, uh, kids got sent down to the countryside, and they often got sent down to countryside for extended periods of time. And that it was often the case that, that these choices, that, that within a household, because certainly during the 1960s when the Cultural Revolution began, in the cities there was no single child policy, and so a typical household at that time could have three or four kids that not all the kids got sent down. And so often that there was some choice that was made about who got sent down, because all the kids didn't get sent down, and so there was some discretion or choice that was being made by the household in terms of 
son, daughter, who happened to, to get set down. So there's that kind of, that dimension to it. Later on, these kids come back, and so there's going to be these important decisions that households are going to have to make. Some kids got sent down, some didn't. These may be affecting their lifetime earnings. You know, what do we do? Do we try to compensate? So that's kind of the cultural revolution kind of context here where parents have, these decisions have been made, and then the question is that do parents later on in life try to compensate, try to offset some of these kinds of decisions or choices that were made. The Sophie's Choice end of it is that there's a very famous book by, uh, by an American author named William Styron, very famous, and then probably even more famous because Americans tend, they often don't read, they like movies. Uh, there's a very famous movie also called Sophie's Choice. Sophie's Choice was a very famous movie in the early 1980s. Are there any American movie fans here? Anyone ever watch American movies? All right. Well, you know who Meryl Streep is. So anyway, so there's this famous movie. But what this book is all about is that the setting is World War II. And the setting is World War II, and it's Germany. And that there's a, a mother uh, who has two young children who get sent to a concentration camp you know, during the war. So she gets sent to the concentration camp you know, because her husband had been part of the resistance who had been in Germany, had been fighting the Nazis. The Nazis were, the, were Hitler and the bad guys. When she goes ahead and when she comes to the concentration camp is that what she's told is that she can only keep one of the children. So she has a son, she has a daughter, and that what they tell her is that she has to make a choice, son or daughter. If she doesn't make a choice, she's going to lose both of them. So the entire book, you know, in part, again, is about kind of this choice that Sophie has to go ahead and to make at this point in life. Does she decide to save the life of her daughter? Does she decide to save the life uh, of her son? So the title here, this paper, Sophie's Choice, you know, is in some sense kind of, an, it's not as extreme, but an equally difficult kind of decision that these parents are making. Cultural revolution, you have to make a decision. One of your kids needs to be sent down, right? So in this case, it's not as extreme because almost all the kids who got sent down, they came back. But then the decision is, is that once they come back, what do you do? And so in this paper that what they're going to do, and I think someone had talked about, we talked about this briefly the other day, this paper is going to take advantage of all these twin studies that have been done in China. So Zhang Junsen and Mark Rosenzweig have done a lot of twin studies in the context of China. So one of the reasons that we like to use twin studies is because at least, you know, if we happen to have twins and the twins are identical, that at least in some sense the genetic differences between the, t ch uh, between the kids is going to be similar. It's not going to be identical, and we know that that now that there's all of the kinds of reasons to kind of mitigate that, but they're going to be a lot more in terms of genetic similarity. So here they're going to take advantage of the fact that we're going to have some identical twins and some non-identical twins. And what they want to do is that they want to use this kind of information then from this twin study about who got sent down, who didn't get set down, transfers then later on in life to take a look at motivations of parents, to take a look at issues about favoritism. You know, was it the case that parents, when they made these decisions, did they favor certain kinds of children over others? Did they favor the child maybe who they perceived as being more able than the other? So favoritism. Were they altruistic? After the fact, did they transfer resources to their children? Third, did they feel guilty? Guilt in this particular case is going to be that I've made a decision to send one of my kids down to the countryside conditional on that and their, you know, holding for their ability, did I decide then later on in life to transfer more resources to them? So what this paper does, and it kind of draws on a classic paper by, by Mark and, and Jerry Behrman from Penn that did this kind of in the, con not this exact thing, but in the context of twin studies in the United States, it's going to exploit these differences in these kinds of twins, identical twins, non-identical twins. They end up having some rather interesting empirical implications to be able to sort out on the context of the behavior that was made, the kids that got sent down, how well they did later on in life, to sort out the role uh, of these various motivations. And so my last slide here is I'll just take you all the way down, I think, uh, to the important one. I can see it. So here, in terms of what the results are suggesting, first of all, and I certainly wouldn't have never expected that, there's actually a positive return to being sent down to the countryside. So now in North America, we talk about resiliency and kids being resilient, so there's a little bit of that. Uh, also, find that, uh, that the, the estimates imply, and this comes, again, out of the theory, 
the kids from poorer families were much more likely to be sent down. But it was also the case that within a household that the weaker kids within households were in fact uh, sent down. So those are the results that kind of come out of the empirics and then just kind of some last set of results. Um, so this comes out of the theory that the positive coefficient on the years that the kids were sent down, positive return to rustification, suggests guilt. So this kind of comes out of the, uh, out of the modeling. Um, certainly implies some altruism. And finally, the results are implying favoritism of the better endowed child. So here they're really using the theory in some sense to the max, trying to exploit some things about these twin studies to try to tease out uh, these alternative motivations that may be underlying parents. So just kind of these, these final thoughts. So, you know, when we look at these issues about households, and even here in China, there's lots of really interesting issues, just this behavior of households is extremely important. And if you kind of thought about some of these studies that you know, people are beginning to do about left behind kids, you know, these are in some sense even studies that demand much more rigorous models, kind of models in terms of how households happen to be behaving. Because households are making decisions in this particular regard. Does the husband decide to go out? Does the husband and the wife decide to go out? Who do they leave them with? So very kind of complicated decisions that these households happen to be making with respect to uh, whether or not they decide to, the parents decide to migrate and leave the kids to, in the village to be raised by relatives and in-laws. Um, so I think there's just an enormous amount that can be done you know, in this regard. We're seeing it you know, in China, issues about the marriage market, uh, issues, again, about these left-behind kids. I think so the household is just central uh, to all of these issues uh, that we may be uh, talking about. And in the Chinese context, we know that there's all kinds of policies that are being carried out to try to kind of lessen, to try to attenuate these differences. Um, but clearly, I think the effectiveness of these policies depends on certainly good empirical work. Uh, but all of the, the empirical work that we do, in some sense, needs to be predicated on really better models of how these households are making their decisions. And so in these papers, some of these papers that uh, we've gone ahead and that we've gone, gone through, is that they devoted a fair amount of attention to developing slightly better, more rigorous models of how households behave uh, in order to try to generate sets of testable predictions. And then, again, with very often very good data to try to test those. So this is an area, I think, that in lots of ways, if you're interested in development or applied kind of labor or applied micro, these are areas where there are just all kinds of, I think, issues and interesting and, and fascinating work that are being done. So that's it. So thank you. Thank you.